In our last lesson, we discussed performing different operations on polynomials. We added, subtracted, multiplied, and divided. And today, in this lesson, I'd like to really focus on division of polynomials. When we divide polynomials, we create very interesting new functions called rational functions. A rational expression or a rational function is a ratio of two polynomials. So it's basically just one polynomial divided by another polynomial. So for example, x squared plus 1 divided by x squared minus 1 is a rational expression or a rational function. And so is something like x to the fifth plus 4x divided by x to the fourth plus 1. In this lesson, I'd like to spend some time talking about how to simplify rational expressions whenever we can. And then I'd like to talk about adding and subtracting rational expressions. To be honest, the same tools that worked when you were simplifying fractions that just involved numbers, as well as the tools you use to add and subtract numerical fractions, will work with rational expressions as well. But because of all the variables that are floating around, there's a little bit more complication when we're adding and subtracting rational expressions. So let's get started as we walk through several examples today. First, let's spend some time talking about simplifying rational expressions. So let's just look at a, a very straightforward example. Let's simplify x times x minus 2 divided by the product of x plus 1 times x minus 1 times x minus 2. Now, I want you to notice that I've sort of started with a nice example where all the terms, the, both the numerator and the denominator, are already in factored form. That's very helpful to us because once we see these terms, these factors, we can start looking for cancellations. And that's one of the biggest ways we're going to simplify one of these rational expressions. I want you to notice that there's an x minus 2 term in both the numerator as well as the denominator. And because those x minus 2s are factors of the numerator and denominator, I can cancel them. And what that'll leave me with is x divided by x plus 1 times x minus 1. And that's as simple as we can get it. So that's the final answer uh, to this example. But before we leave the example, I want to mention something. You might be saying to yourself, should we multiply out that denominator before we stop with this example? The answer is actually no. There's really a good deal of information that we know from the factored form of that denominator. And we'll use that information when we start talking about graphs of rational functions in a few lessons. So, Anytime you can leave something in factored form, you probably ought to do so. And so let's leave that example exactly as it is. Now, I'd like to look at a few more examples of simplifying rational expressions. So let's go on to this example. Let's simplify 4x plus 12 divided by 9x plus 27. Okay, the key in any problem like this is to start factoring the numerator and the denominator. I was sort of nice to us in the previous example because everything was already factored. But I, I want us to now factor numerator and denominator here, and then let's see if there's any sort of hidden factors that are in common with the numerator and the denominator, and then we'll cancel those out. So let's focus on the numerator first. What can we factor out of the numerator? Well, notice that there's a 4 in both 4x and 12, and so I can factor out that 4. And when I do so, I can rewrite the numerator as 4 times the quantity x plus 3. Think about it. If you were to distribute that 4 back in, you would have 4x plus 12, and that's what we started with. So the factored form of the numerator is 4 times the quantity x plus 3. Now, what about the denominator? Well, if you stare at the denominator for a moment, you'll see that there's a 9 in both pieces of that denominator, so we can factor out a 9 from the denominator and get 9 times x plus 3. So the expression I started with can be rewritten in an equivalent way as 4 times x plus 3 divided by 9 times x plus 3. And now if you stare at that for a second, you realize there was actually a common term hiding in both the numerator and denominator as factors of the numerator and denominator, and that's the x plus 3. So I can actually cancel that x plus 3 now from the top and the bottom. I don't know if you saw that coming, but it's done, and now our original expression is actually simplified to just the numerical fraction 4 divided by 9. 
So what we started with was a lot more complicated looking than four ninths, but that's actually the final answer in that example. Okay, let's move to another example, a similar type. Let's simplify 5x minus 10 divided by x squared minus 4. By the way, these kinds of simplifications are very important, so I don't mind going through several examples as we walk through this lesson. We really need to be able to simplify these kinds of rational expressions. To begin, we just need to factor the top and the bottom, the numerator and the denominator. That's almost always going to be the first step that we'll do here. The numerator is pretty straightforward to factor. There's a 5 in common with both pieces of that numerator. And so if I factor out the 5, I'll be left with 5 times x minus 2. That's the numerator. Now leave it alone for a moment. Let's look at the denominator. The denominator is actually a difference of two squares. It's x squared minus 4. And we've seen in our previous lessons on factoring that we can factor x squared minus 4 as x minus 2 times x plus 2. And therefore, the expression we started with is equivalent to, or the same as, 5 times x minus 2 on top divided by x minus 2 times x plus 2 in the denominator. Now you see that the x minus 2 is a factor of both the numerator and the denominator, and so those x minus 2s can cancel. They cancel with one another, and it leaves us with 5 divided by x plus 2. And that's our final answer in that example. Okay, let's try an example that's a bit more complicated now and see how these same steps will work to simplify another rational expression. Here's the one I want to simplify. x cubed minus x squared minus 6x divided by x squared plus 5x plus 6. Okay, now I can imagine some of you having the following thought come right to your mind. Wait a minute, I didn't learn how to factor polynomials that have degree 3. Look at that numerator, it actually has an x cubed in it. What in the world am I supposed to do with that? Well, okay, good thought, but before we get too worried about it, let's look at that numerator polynomial more closely, because actually you know how to handle that numerator. So, notice that there's an x in all three terms of the numerator. And that means that an x can actually be factored out of that numerator. And it leaves us with a numerator of the form x times x squared minus x minus 6. Notice the x squared minus x minus 6 that's in the parentheses there is quadratic. And you know how to handle quadratic polynomials. So there's an x out in front, fine. Just leave it there for a moment. It's a factor in the numerator. And now let's attack that polynomial inside the parentheses, x squared minus x minus 6. After you think about it for a moment, you kind of refresh your memory on how we factor quadratic polynomials, you'll find that x squared minus x minus 6 can be factored as x minus 3 times x plus 2. If you don't believe me, FOIL, multiply out via FOIL the x minus 3 times x plus 2, and you'll see that you get exactly what you want. And that means that the numerator now is equal to x times x minus 3 times x plus 2. And now you have completely factored the numerator that you might not have thought you could factor originally. So that's all set. Now let's not worry about the numerator for a moment. Let's look down at the denominator. We have a quadratic polynomial there, x squared plus 5x plus 6. I'd love to be able to factor it. Again, I want to think about it for a moment. I'm going to have an x plus something times another x plus something. And in this case, it's going to be x plus 2 times x plus 3, because 2 times 3 gives me the 6, and 2 plus 3 gives me the 5. And that means that the rational expression I started with, which was kind of messy looking when we began, can be rewritten as x times x minus 3 times x plus 2 divided by the product x plus 2 times x plus 3. And now, once you've got it written in this factored form, which is equal to what you started with, you see that there's an x plus 2 as a factor in both the numerator and denominator. And those x plus 2s can be canceled. And once you cancel them, you're left with x times x minus 3, all divided by x plus 3. Now, at this point, I'd really like to share a potential pitfall with you, actually two of them 
First, with the example we just did, I'd like to point out that some students might quickly jump to canceling an x minus 3 with an x plus 3. Don't do that. You've got to watch those signs. You'll be okay as long as you're careful about it. But you've got to be careful that everything has the same sign. So you wouldn't want to cancel the x minus 3 with the x plus 3. There's a second pitfall that you actually really need to worry about in the sense that a lot of students make the following mistake. So let me show you an example that you might misrepresent the first time you do it. Uh, let's just look at it slowly and carefully, and then we'll go from there. Here's the example. I want to simplify x squared plus 2x all divided by 2x. Now, what some students have done in my career in teaching, I've watched them do this, is that they will want to immediately see those 2x's cancel from one another. And so they'll cancel the 2x's, they'll scratch them out, and what they're left with then, they think, is x squared plus 1 divided by 1, or just x squared plus 1. Uh, I can't scream no loud enough if uh, someone does that, because that's not correct. You can't cancel those 2x's from the numerator and the denominator, because the 2x in the numerator is not a factor of the whole numerator. In other words, that 2x in the numerator is not being multiplied with something else, it's being added with the x squared. So you're really not allowed to cancel those two x's. So you should back up from the problem as you start it, and you should ask yourself, how can I factor the numerator, and how can I factor the denominator if needed, and then cancel from there? So don't cancel those two x's. Be very careful. When something is added like that, like the two x's being added in the numerator, you cannot just cancel those two x's. Now, let's step back and actually do the problem correctly. We started with x squared plus 2x divided by 2x. There's a common x in the numerator that you can factor out. So that means the numerator can be rewritten as x times x plus 2. And the whole expression then can be written as x times x plus 2 divided by 2 times x. And now you can cancel but you're going to cancel the x's because there's an x in the numerator that's a factor and there's an x in the denominator that's a factor. The x in the denominator is being multiplied with the 2. And when you cancel those x's, you're left with x plus 2 divided by 2. And x plus 2 divided by 2 is the final answer and it's the correct answer. Now, there's one more pitfall. It's not as common, but it's still very important for us to note. And so let's look at one more example of simplifying these rational expressions. I want to simplify x divided by the quantity x squared plus 3x. So the first thing I want to do is look to factor both numerator and denominator. Of course, the numerator is already factored because it's just x. But the denominator has an x that's common in both the x squared and the 3x. So I can factor that x out of the denominator, and my rational expression can then be written as x on top divided by x times x plus 3. At this point, I can cancel the x on top with the single x in the denominator, and it leaves me 1 in the numerator divided by x plus 3. Sometimes students will incorrectly want to write this as just x plus 3, as if the x plus 3 was actually in the numerator. But I need you to notice that the x plus 3 is actually in the denominator. It started in the denominator, it's still in the denominator. So your final answer is exactly 1 divided by x plus 3. Keep that x plus 3 in the denominator. That's where it belongs. You want to be careful as you do that. Okay, we've done a, a lot of examples just simplifying rational expressions. What I'd like to do now in the remainder of our lesson is to move on to adding and subtracting some rational expressions. So let's move on to the following example. Let's add 4x divided by x minus 2 and 5x divided by x minus 2. Now, the key thing you need to remember when you're adding any fractions, whether they have just numbers in them or they have variables in them, is that when you want to add or subtract those fractions, you've got to get common denominators. In this case, we're starting with a nice, straightforward first example. The denominators are already the same. So all I have to do then is add the two numerators. And when I do that, 4x plus 5x 
equals 9x. Thankfully, those are both like terms, right? There's an x and an x in both of those. So 4x plus 5x is just 9x. And it's that simple. What we started with is just equal to 9x divided by x minus 2. It might look a bit ugly at first with that x minus 2 in the denominator, but overall, the same process as if you were just adding fractions that involved numbers. Okay, so let's try a slightly more complicated example, this time uh, a subtraction example. So here it is. I want us to simplify 7x minus 2 divided by 3x plus 6 minus x plus 7 divided by 3x plus 6. Now, notice that this is a subtraction now instead of an addition, and so I have to make sure that my denominators are the same. I have to have common denominators, as some people would say, before I can actually perform the subtraction. Well, the denominators are the same. So I can just go ahead and subtract the numerators and we'll be done. But don't forget, when you have that subtraction, you have to distribute that minus sign throughout the term x plus 7, the second numerator, if you will. So here's what I'm going to have. I have 7x minus 2 divided by 3x plus 6 minus x plus 7 divided by 3x plus 6 equals one fraction. Denominator is going to be 3x plus 6. The numerator is going to be 7x minus 2 minus x minus 7. I get minus x minus 7 from distributing that minus sign that was sitting in front of the quantity x plus 7. And once I've distributed that minus sign, I can then combine the like terms so that the numerator, 7x minus 2 minus x minus 7, becomes 6x minus 9. Because 7x minus x is 6x, minus 2 minus 7 is minus 9. And my new fraction is 6x minus 9 divided by 3x plus 6. Now, you might be tempted to just stop and say, I'm done. Everything's finished. But even though your work is correct up to this point, there's still actually the possibility that things can be simplified. So before we stop, let's start factoring the numerator and the denominator, and let's just see if there's any cancellation that can happen. Well, the numerator's definitely got a 3 in it, and I can factor it out because 3 goes into 6 and 3 goes into 9. When I factor that 3 out, I have 3 times 2x minus 3. That's my numerator. I can't do anything else with 2x minus 3 at this point. The denominator has a 3 in common with the 3x and the 6, and so the denominator can be rewritten as 3 times x plus 2. And now I see that there's a factor of 3 on top, and there's a factor of 3 on the bottom. And those factors can be canceled, and it leaves me with 2x minus 3 divided by x plus 2. And I can't emphasize this pitfall enough, so I'm going to say it here. Don't cancel those 2's. I see a 2 with the 2x, and I see a 2 down in the denominator. But they're not factors of the top and bottom. They're being added to other parts of the numerator and denominator. So they're not factored out, and they can't be canceled. So what we had was exactly all we can get. And once it's done, it's done. Now, what happens if the denominators aren't so nice? I mean, the examples I just gave you had the same denominators. So it didn't seem like those problems were very complicated. What happens if the denominators are different? Well, you do the same thing you would have done if you were adding or subtracting fractions with numbers. You get a least common denominator. So let's look at the following example to kind of get our feet wet with getting these least common denominators. Let's simplify 4 divided by 25x plus 23 divided by 100. Now, notice that the denominators are different. That's the first thing you must notice and therefore you've got to get a common denominator. And so I'm going to start by factoring the two denominators to see what the factors of each one are. So here we go. 25x is just 5 times 5 times x, and 100 is 2 times 2 times 5 times 5. And that means that my least common denominator is going to need a 5 times 5, it's going to need an x, and it's going to need a 2 times 2. And when I multiply 2 times 2 times 5 times 5 times x, it means I'm going to have 100x. 100x needs to be my denominator. So I now need to rewrite both fractions with 100x as the denominator. Let's do that. The 4 over 25x needs an extra 4 multiplied with the 25. If I multiply a 4 in the denominator, 
then I must multiply a 4 in the numerator as well, so everything stays balanced. And that means that 4 over 25x is going to be the same as 16 over 100x. 16 is 4 times 4, and 100 is 25 times 4. So that fraction is 16 over 100x. The other fraction, 23 divided by 100, simply needs an x thrown into the denominator to get 100x there. If you multiply the bottom by x, you must multiply the top by x. So that that fraction becomes 23x divided by 100x. And now, you have two fractions being added, which both have the same denominator of 100x. And therefore, you can add the numerators, and you'll just get 23x plus 16 in the numerator, all divided by 100x. And notice something, you cannot do anything with the 23x plus 16 to try to simplify it, because they're not like terms. The 23x has an x in it, the 16 doesn't. And therefore, your final answer in this problem, when you add those two things together, is just 23x plus 16, all divided by 100x. Okay, let's look at another example where you want to add, and you've got two different denominators. And let's see what happens. Let's simplify x divided by 2x plus 1, plus 5 divided by x minus 1. Now, immediately I look at those denominators, and they're not the same. So I've got to get the least common denominator before I can ever do this addition. In this case, the two denominators have nothing in common in terms of factors. And so the least common denominator is simply going to be the product of the two denominators you started with. So the denominator I'm going to end up with is 2x plus 1 times x minus 1. Now, if that's the denominator I need, then I have to go back to the original two fractions and rewrite them with those two, with that denominator, the 2x plus 1 times x minus 1. So let's do that. The first fraction was x divided by 2x plus 1. I need to multiply that denominator by an x minus 1, and if I multiply the denominator by x minus 1, I must multiply the numerator by x minus 1 as well. And therefore, that first fraction is going to become x times x minus 1, all divided by 2x plus 1 times x minus 1. Okay, leave that one alone for a second. Let's now look at the second fraction. We had 5 divided by x minus 1. It needs a denominator of 2x plus 1 times x minus 1. So I have to multiply the denominator by 2x plus 1. If I do that, I must multiply the numerator by 2x plus 1 so that everything stays balanced. And that means that the second fraction becomes 5 times 2x plus 1, all divided by 2x plus 1 times x minus 1. Now, it looks like we've really just messed everything up, but what we've done in the process is to get the two fractions to have common denominators. And once they have the same denominator, I can simply add the numerators and I'm done. Which means up to this point, my problem now becomes x times x minus 1 plus 5 times 2x plus 1, all divided by the common denominator 2x plus 1 times x minus 1. Now, what has to be done? I now just need to simplify the numerator, and I'm done. So let's just focus on the numerator now for just a moment. I have x times x minus 1 plus 5 times 2x plus 1. Well, I can distribute the x into the x minus 1 to get x squared minus x, and I can distribute the 5 into the 2x plus 1 to get 10x plus 5. And now I can combine the like terms. And the only terms that are like terms are the negative x plus 10x, and that's going to give me 9x. And therefore, the numerator becomes x squared plus 9x plus 5. And that means that the final answer is x squared plus 9x plus 5, all divided by 2x plus 1 times x minus 1. Now, I said final answer. You might be asking, well, maybe that simplifies. Maybe I could have factored the numerator and canceled with something in the denominator. You could try that. But it turns out that in this example, it won't happen. There is no good cancellation between the numerator and the denominator. There's really no good factorization of the numerator. So you can work on that, but it turns out that what I've given you there is actually the final answer to that example. Now, let's look at another example. It's got some more complication to it as we try to do the subtraction. So here it is. Let's simplify x divided by x squared minus 9 minus x divided by x squared plus 6x plus 9. 
Now again, anytime I want to do a subtraction like this or an addition of two rational expressions, I have to get common denominators. So I need to make the two denominators look the same. And the way to do that is to start by factoring each of the denominators and see what we have. So let's look at the two denominators. x squared minus 9 is a difference of two squares, and so it factors as x minus 3 times x plus 3. Good, that's what the first denominator looks like in factored form. The second denominator is x squared plus 6x plus 9, and that's actually a perfect square trinomial because it factors as x plus 3 times x plus 3 or just x plus 3 squared. And so if I need to figure out my LCD, my least common denominator, I know that I need an x minus 3, and I'm actually going to need an x plus 3 squared. And therefore, my common denominator really is x minus 3 times x plus 3 squared. Now I've got to go back to the original fractions and rewrite them with this common denominator. So let's do that together. First, let me rewrite the original problem as x divided by x minus 3 times x plus 3 minus x divided by x plus 3 squared. Now, all I've done there is factored the denominators, but that helps me to see now what each denominator needs to have multiplied with it in order to get the common denominator. So once I've got it written that way, let's now walk through and get the common denominator. The first fraction needs an extra x plus 3 so that it ends up with an x plus 3 squared in the denominator. If I multiply by an x plus 3 in the denominator, I have to multiply by an x plus 3 in the numerator. And so the first fraction is going to look like x times x plus 3 divided by x minus 3 times x plus 3 squared. Excellent. Leave that alone now, and let's look at the second fraction. The x over x plus 3 squared, what does it need in order to have the correct common denominator? Well, it needs an x minus 3. That's the factor it's missing. So I'm going to multiply the denominator, and therefore the numerator as well, by x minus 3. And when I do so, the second fraction becomes x times x minus 3 divided by the common denominator x minus 3 times x plus 3 squared. Wow, now we have a common denominator. Both fractions have the same denominator, and therefore I can combine the numerators under this one denominator, and I'll be done. So what does my fraction look like? It's going to look like x times x plus 3 minus x times x minus 3 all divided by x minus 3 times x plus 3 squared. Now I've got to distribute all these pieces in the numerator, so let's do that pretty quickly. I have x times x plus 3. That's going to become x squared plus 3x. Now let's be very careful with the second numerator. It's minus x times x minus 3. So I've got to watch that minus sign for a second that's out in front of the x. When I combine all that, here's what I'm going to get. I'm going to get minus x squared because of the x times x. And then I'm going to have plus 3x. Now, where'd the plus come from? It's coming from the minus out in front of the x with the minus out in front of the 3. And the negative times the negative will give me a positive. And the x times 3 is 3x. And therefore, my numerator is now x squared plus 3x minus x squared plus 3x, and the denominator is just x minus 3 times x plus 3 squared. Now, combine the terms in the numerator. Actually, there's a lot of things you can combine. x squared minus x squared, 0. They cancel each other out. 3x plus 3x is 6x. And so your final answer is 6x divided by x minus 3 times x plus 3 squared. Notice there's no other cancellation that you can do there. There's no factor of x in the denominator, for example, which is going to cancel with the x up in the numerator, and no numbers in the denominator are going to cancel with that 6. And therefore, your final answer really is 6x divided by x minus 3 times x plus 3 squared. Well, we've looked at a lot of examples today of simplifying rational expressions, uh, how to add rational expressions, and how to subtract those rational expressions. We've noticed that we've had to factor numerator and denominator as we've gone to see if there's any cancellations that can take place, and that's a very important tool for simplifying rational expressions. We've got to be careful that we correctly cancel, and I talked a bit about some examples of doing it the wrong way, so to speak. And when adding or subtracting these rational expressions,
we notice that we have to have a common denominator just like we did when we were dealing with just fractions with numbers in them. We're going to continue talking about rational expressions in our next lesson, and we'll talk about multiplying and dividing them. I'll see you then.
In the last few lessons, we've spent time discussing how to simplify and combine rational functions and rational expressions. Now I'd like to talk about what the graphs of these rational functions look like. We've talked about the graphs of lots of functions in this set of lessons. Linear functions, which had lines, and quadratic functions, which were parabolas. And we talked a bit about graphs of general polynomials as well. In all those cases, we started with plotting some special points, maybe the x-intercepts or the y-intercept, and in the case of parabolas, the vertex. We just then connected the dots to finish sketching our graphs. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the most interesting looking graphs that I think we're going to see in this course. And in today's lesson in particular, I want us to learn some of the tools we need to successfully sketch the graphs of lots of different rational functions. So today's lesson is more about building the tools in our toolbox than it is using those tools. We'll do that in a later lesson. But for today, I just, I just want you to work with me on what the tools would be to sketch the graphs of lots of different rational functions. Well, what would those tools be? Well, we're going to want to find the x-intercepts. Those are very helpful. Uh, and we're going to find some things that we'll call asymptotes. And I'll tell you what the asymptotes are a little later in this lesson. By the end of the next lesson, we'll see lots of different graphs of rational functions. But for now, let's talk about some of these basic tools that we need to start graphing these rational functions. I'm going to warn you, I want you to be patient and work with this material with me as we walk through the lesson. There are lots of tools we need in order to sketch these graphs. So let's start out by talking about how to find the x-intercept of a rational function. So let's just jump right into an example and get us started. Let's find the x-intercepts of the graph of y equals x squared minus 11x plus 24 divided by x squared plus x minus 20. Now, let's remember, what's true about the x-intercepts of the graph of a function? Well, the x-intercepts are points that live on the x-axis. So they are points where the y value has to be zero, so that the point never leaves the x-axis. And that means that you and I want to solve an equation like zero equals x squared minus 11x plus 24 divided by x squared plus x minus 20 if we want to find the x-intercepts. In other words, if you want to find the x-intercepts, of one of these functions, you set y equal to 0 and solve for x. Now, what do you do to try to solve this equation for x? It looks kind of messy. Well, there's one way to actually clean it up really fast, and that is you multiply both sides of the equation by the denominator. In other words, multiply both sides by x squared plus x minus 20. Well, let me ask you a question. If you multiply the left-hand side, 0, by x squared plus x minus 20, what are you going to get? Well, you're going to get 0 because 0 times anything is 0. So the left-hand side is still 0. What's going to happen on the other side when you have a denominator with x squared plus x minus 20 and you've multiplied by x squared plus x minus 20? What will those ter two terms do? They'll cancel with one another. And that means you're left with just 0 equals x squared minus 11x plus 24. So let's just pause for a moment. If you go back to the original problem, we're down now to just checking when the numerator of the function we were given equals 0. Practically speaking, that's pretty much what you want to do in order to find the x-intercepts of any one of these graphs. Set the numerator equal to 0 and solve for x. I might say a little more about that later with some examples, but basically, Set, setting the numerator equal to zero will help us find those x-intercepts. So now, let's go back to that equation and solve for x. We had x squared minus 11x plus 24 equals zero. I've just flipped things around. That's okay. Nothing wrong with that. And now, what do I want to do to solve for x? I'm going to factor the left-hand side. And the left-hand side factors as x minus 8 times x minus 3. You can check that with FOIL if you'd like. And that's equal to zero. And that means that x minus 8 is 0 or x minus 3 is 0. And that means that either x equals 8 or x equals 3. 
Guess what? You just found the two x-intercepts for the rational function we started with. One of the x-intercepts is at the point 3 comma 0, and the other one is at 8 comma 0. Congratulations. It's your first set of x-intercepts for a rational function. Now, let's move to another example where we find the x-intercepts of a rational function. Let's look at this uh, function. y equals x minus 2 times x plus 3 divided by x minus 5 times x plus 1. Well, as I said in the earlier example, what we really need to do to find the x-intercepts is to set the numerator equal to 0 and solve for x. But here's a small warning. Actually, the first thing you need to do is to make sure there isn't any cancellation between the numerator and the denominator. In this case, there isn't any cancellation between the top and the bottom, so, and everything is already factored for us, so we can pretty quickly see that there aren't any cancellations. So all I'm going to do now is set the numerator equal to 0 and solve for x. And it's already factored, so you have x minus 2 times x plus 3 equals 0. And that means either x minus 2 equals 0 or x plus 3 equals 0. And if you move those constants around, it tells you that x equals 2 or x equals negative 3. And that means that you have two x-intercepts. The, the graph is going to cross the x-axis at x equals 2 and x equals negative 3. Now, if you had a piece of graph paper, you could actually plot these intercepts as the start, the very start, of graphing the rational function we started with. Well, I guess the real start would be drawing the axes. But once you've drawn the axes in, you could plot these two intercepts on the x-axis. In fact, you could plot lots of other points by hand. But as is often the case with rational functions, the coordinates of the points can get a bit messy. You can imagine trying to plug 7 in for x in the function I gave you at the beginning, and it really would get quite messy trying to figure out what y is. But if you filled in the graph, you'd get a pretty crazy looking graph, I promise. It would look something like the following image. But before you freak out and say, oh my word, I don't want to work on this, don't get too intimidated. We have lots of tools, as I've already said, that we're going to learn in order to be able to come up with this wavy, disconnected, bizarre looking graph. I don't want you to get overwhelmed. To be honest, after we do a couple lessons together, you'll be able to draw that graph yourself from scratch. So stay with me as we build these tools together. The x-intercepts are just one tool of many that will help us to actually build these kind of graphs. I just wanted you to see one of those graphs, though, so you could see how interesting I think they are and how different they are. They're broken into pieces, and they go in all sorts of directions. But we'll get to the point where we can actually build those together. Let's look at one more example where we find x-intercepts. Let's find the x-intercepts of the graph of y equals 1 divided by x minus 2. Now, as we've already done in the earlier examples, we need to set the numerator equal to 0 and solve for x. That means we're looking at 1 equals 0. Now, when is 1 equal to 0? Answer, never. What does that mean? Well, here's what it means. It means that the graph doesn't have any x-intercepts. Or, to put it more visually, the graph never crosses the x-axis. And that's pretty cool. And if you want to look at a sketch of the graph, you can see one here. Notice that what you have are two different pieces, one of which, up in quadrant 1, comes down and tries to hug uh, the x-axis, but it never, never crosses it. It just sort of gets really, really close to it. And the other piece of the graph comes up from underneath the x-axis, and it also looks like it's trying to touch it, but it never does. There's never an x-intercept here, even though the pieces of the graph get really, really close to the x-axis. Now, let's look at one more example about x-intercepts for equations that are rational expressions. I want to find the x-intercepts of y equals x minus 5 times x plus 3 divided by x minus 5 times x plus 7. Now, before we jump into setting the numerator equal to 0, we do have to look for these cancellations. And in this case, I've already written everything in factored form for you. You can see a cancellation. The x minus 5 factors have to be canceled before we do anything else. And this is really important. We need to remember that throughout this example, 
we can never plug in x equal 5 into the equation because the equation is undefined at x equals 5. To use fancier language, we could say that the number 5 is not in the domain of the original function because plugging in 5 in the original function would cause division by 0. So here's a very important point to make. In the graph of this equation, you actually have an open circle or a hole poked into the graph at x equals 5. And we have to remember then, as we go through the example, if we were really trying to graph it ourselves, that we don't have an x-intercept there. We actually have this little open hole because plugging in x equals 5 would have caused division by 0. Now, once we've made that mental note that we can't plug in x equals 5, we can then rewrite the equation after some cancellation as y equals x plus 3 divided by x plus 7. And now I can set the new numerator equal to 0 to find the x-intercepts. Well, that's just going to be x plus 3 equals 0, which is the same as x equals negative 3. One x-intercept, x equals negative 3. And a quick sketch of the graph will show you that it really only does cross the x-axis at one place, and it crosses the x-axis at x equals negative 3. Okay, so we've talked about x-intercepts, we've talked about several examples with those. I'd like to move now to some other tools that we're going to need when we're sketching the graphs of these rational functions. The next thing I'd like to talk about is called a vertical asymptote. Now, here's the idea of a vertical asymptote. By the way, did you notice in some of the graphs we've already seen in this lesson that the pieces of the graphs looked like at times they were just taking off either in the sort of plus infinity direction or in the negative infinity direction? Those pieces are trying to get very, very close to a certain vertical line. And that vertical line is what we're going to call a vertical asymptote. From a practical perspective, if you have a line x equals c, which is a vertical asymptote of the graph, then as the values of x get really, really close to the number c, the values of the function, the y values, get huge, and they get huge fast. They either go to plus infinity or they go to minus infinity. So let's do a quick example to think about what's happening with a vertical asymptote. Let's do some numbers here. Let's think about the graph of y equals 1 divided by x minus 2. I want you to notice that we cannot plug in x equals 2 in this function because that would cause division by 0. But what happens when you plug in numbers for x which are really close to 2? For example, what if you plugged in x equals 2.0000001? Well, that's really close to x equals 2. And by the way, it's just to the right of x equals 2 on the number line. Think about it. 2.0000001 would be just to the right of 2. Well, if you plug that in, you're going to have y equals 1 divided by 2.0000001 minus 2. What does that equal if you simplify? Well, you get 1 divided by 0 0.0000001. And if you do that reciprocal and actually calculate what that fraction is, you actually get 10 million. Now, that is huge, and that's the y value. So when x is 2.0000001, the y value is going up to 10 million. So what's happening in the graph? As the x values get really, really close to 2, say coming in from the right of 2, the y values are taking off really, really fast to plus infinity. Now, we could ask a very similar question if we took x values that are close to 2, but from the left. Like if you plugged in 1.9999999. If you do that and you calculate the numbers again, you'll find that you're going to get a negative large number. And it's going to be negative this time because 1.9999999 minus 2 is actually negative. It's small but it's negative. And so when I take the reciprocal of that, I'll get a negative very large number. And so when I'm plugging in x values to the left of 2, the y values are dipping down negative but big. And that's why the arms of this graph actually do like this, and one piece goes up 
and the other piece goes down, right around the vertical line, x equals 2. So that x equals 2 is what we call a vertical asymptote. It acts almost like a barrier, like a wall that keeps the two pieces of the graph from getting close to each other. And in the process, the graph takes off in one direction. Sometimes both sides go up together in the same direction. Sometimes they go in opposite directions. And depending on the function we're looking at, we have to decide where the pieces of the graph actually go. So it's important to realize that a vertical asymptote is actually not part of the graph of the rational function. Let me say it again. The vertical asymptote really acts more like a wall through which the graph can't pass. It's like a natural border for the graph. So although the vertical asymptote is not really a part of the graph, we can use it as a very important tool to find sort of where the graph is going to go, where the borders of the graph are. And they're very helpful, these vertical asymptotes, when we're looking at graphs of rational functions. Now, how do you find a vertical asymptote in general? Well, do you remember the example I just did, 1 over x minus 2? What did I look for there? I looked for a value of x where the denominator equaled 0. So that's exactly what I want to do every time I want to find a vertical asymptote. I'm going to take the rational function I'm given, I'm going to cancel out everything that I can, and after I've done the cancellation, I'm going to look for the values of x which make the denominator equal to 0. Or, to put it a different way, the values of x that would cause division by 0 in my rational function. Okay, so before you feel overwhelmed, let's just pause and do another example or two where we find some vertical asymptotes. So let's do the following. Find the vertical asymptotes of y equals x squared minus 4 divided by x squared minus 9. And before we do anything here, I've got to factor those numerator and denominator so that I can check for any cancellation. Well, if I do the factoring, and it's pretty straightforward because I've got differences of two squares there, the new way of writing the rational function is going to be y equals x minus 2 times x plus 2, all divided by x minus 3 times x plus 3. There's no cancellations. So once I see that there aren't any, I go looking for my vertical asymptotes. They will occur at the values of x where I get 0 in the denominator. So I'm going to look at x minus 3 times x plus 3 equals 0. Well, that's x minus 3 equals 0 or x plus 3 equals 0. And that's the same as x equals 3 or x equals negative 3. Now again, I'm not expecting you to be able to draw this graph right now, but if you just check out this sketch of the graph, you'll see that the pieces of the graph are trying to get really, really close to the vertical lines x equals 3 and x equals negative 3. The pieces of the graph do not touch or cross those two vertical lines but they act almost like a border for the graph, and once we know where those are, it helps us to actually sketch the graph. By the way, while you're looking at that graph, do you see where the x-intercepts are? They're at 2 comma 0 and negative 2 comma 0. And where did those come from? They came from setting the numerator equal to 0, and once we do that, we can see that x equals 2 and x equals negative 2 are exactly the x-intercepts. So there's two tools. Those two tools, the x-intercepts and the vertical asymptotes, help us to start to get a picture for where we can draw the pieces of a rational function's graph. Very good. Now before we close the lesson, I want to talk about another tool that we need when we're graphing rational functions. You see how the pieces of these graphs are trying to go sort of up and down, but you also might have noticed that out on the ends of the graph, it looks like the pieces of the graph are leveling off as if there's also some sort of imaginary or um, non-existent line that's there that's keeping the edges of the graph or the ends of the graph from going anywhere else. They're just sort of leveling off. It turns out that a lot of these rational functions have graphs which have what are known as horizontal asymptotes as well. And they're horizontal because they're flat like this, and they're asymptotes because they, again, serve as places where the graph can get very, very close, but actually not cross, not touch. So, 
I would like to talk now about these horizontal asymptotes and how we find them and how they serve as a border for a graph of a rational function. So let's look back again at the graph of x squared minus 4 divided by x squared minus 9. Now, we talked about the vertical asymptotes at x equals 3 and x equals negative 3, but now I want you to focus on the ends of the graph and look at where they seem to be leveling off. They look like they're leveling off not at the x-axis, but actually just above the x-axis. In fact, it looks like they're getting bordered by the horizontal line y equals 1. If you believe me with that, I'll tell you that you're absolutely right. That's exactly what's happening. y equals 1 is acting, acting like a natural border for the graph at the ends. So the question you should ask is, where does y equal 1 come from? Well, I'll tell you exactly where y equals 1 comes from as the equation of our horizontal asymptote. Go back to the original equation. y equals x squared minus 4 over x squared minus 9. Now here's what I want you to do when you're finding a horizontal asymptote. I want you to erase all of the terms in the numerator and all of the terms in the denominator which are not the dominant terms. Now, just a reminder, the dominant term in the numerator is the x squared and the dominant term in the denominator is the other x squared. Just a Easy way to think of it, the dominant term is the one that has the highest power of x. So in this case, it's going to be the x squared on top and the x squared on the bottom. Once you've erased everything else, you're just left with y equals x squared divided by x squared. Well, wait a minute. x squared divided by x squared, everything cancels out and you're left with y equals 1. And that's exactly the equation for the horizontal asymptote in this example. So, to find a horizontal asymptote, we simply take the rational function that was given to us, we erase all the terms in the top, which are not the dominant term, and we erase all the terms on the bottom, which are not the dominant term, and we just simplify. And if we have a horizontal asymptote, it'll simply fall out in front of us. So, let's look at another example then to find this kind of a horizontal asymptote. Find the horizontal asymptote for this function, y equals, 6x cubed plus 18x squared minus 10x plus 7 divided by 3x cubed minus 5x plus 9. Now, I've purposefully given you a pretty messy looking rational function there because I wanted us to remember how to find these horizontal asymptotes. How do you do it? You take the numerator and you throw out all the terms which are not the dominant term. That means in the numerator, the only term that's going to stay is the 6x cubed. In the denominator, you throw out all the terms which are not the dominant term. The dominant term in the denominator is 3x cubed because x cubed was the largest power of x in the denominator. And now look, you have the equation y equals 6x cubed divided by 3x cubed. The x cubes cancel and you get 6 over 3, which is 2. And bottom line, y equals 2 is the horizontal asymptote for that graph. Now, it's very important to remember that the graph of a rational function is allowed to cross a horizontal asymptote in the middle of the graph. The key is that the graph doesn't cross a horizontal asymptote at the ends of the graph. Let me repeat that. We talked about these horizontal asymptotes acting like a border or a barrier keeping the edge or the ends of the graph from wobbling around. That's very true for a horizontal asymptote. Out on the ends of the graph, the, the edges of the graph will smooth right out. They might come from underneath, they might come from above, but eventually they're just going to hug that horizontal line. They're not going to touch it, they're going to get very, very close. But what happens in the middle of the graph has nothing to do with the horizontal asymptote. So you might have a horizontal asymptote which is not getting crossed out at the ends, but in the middle, the graph is allowed to cross it as much as it wants. So keep in mind, horizontal asymptotes only act as borders on the edges of the graph, not in the middle of the graph. Now, let's look at another example of finding a horizontal asymptote. Remember, we're just building tools that are going to help us draw these graphs on our own one day. So here's the next example. Find the horizontal asymptote of y equals 5x squared plus 3x plus 80 divided by 
4x cubed minus 27x squared plus 18x. Now again, I've given you purposefully a pretty messy looking rational function, but I wanted you to think about how to find the horizontal asymptote here. To find the horizontal asymptote, I'm gonna keep the dominant term in the top and I'm gonna keep the dominant term in the bottom. And that means I'll be left with the equation y equals 5x squared divided by 4x cubed. I've erased all the other terms. Now, this erasing of all the other terms is only to find that horizontal asymptote. I can't get rid of all the other terms if I actually wanna plot the graph. But to find the horizontal asymptote, I throw out all of those other terms, and I'm left with 5x squared over 4x cubed. Now let's cancel. When you do so, you'll have the equation y equals 5 over 4x. Now I want you to notice something about this example compared to the others. We now have some x's still inside the equation. Notice in the first couple of examples, all we had was y equaled a number. Now we have y equals something still with x's in it. And now I need to ask you this question. If you have something like 5 over 4x, and you wanna plug in an x that's way out on the edge of the graph, some number x that's really, really large, what will happen to the fraction 5 divided by 4x? Let's say you wanted to plug in x equals 1 million and look at 5 over 4 times 1 million. If you take out a calculator and look at 5 divided by 4 times a million, you're gonna find that the number is going to be very, very close to zero. It's gonna look like point zero, 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 a lot of zeros, and then something else. So as x gets very, very large out here, five over four x is actually going to get close to zero because the four x is getting huge. And therefore, in this case, when you have y equals five over four x and you're looking for the horizontal asymptote, it turns out that the horizontal asymptote is y equals zero because that four x quantity in the denominator is going to get huge, humongous, as the x gets really big, either out in the positive direction or out in the negative direction. In fact, I can actually give you a rule for when you end up with y equals zero as your horizontal asymptote. When the dominant term on top of your rational expression has a degree which is smaller than the dominant term on the bottom, then the horizontal asymptote occurs at y equals zero. Let me say that again. If your dominant term on top has, say, degree three, and your dominant term on the bottom has degree four, then your horizontal asymptote is going to be y equals zero. Did you notice in the first couple of examples where we found horizontal asymptotes, the degree on top and the degree on the bottom were actually the same? In that case, you'll get a different equation. But when the dominant term on top has smaller degree than the dominant term on the bottom, then you will always have the horizontal asymptote y equals zero. And if you look at the graph of the equation we started with in that example, you'll see that the two ends of the graph are getting very, very close to the line y equals zero. You remember what y equals zero is? It's the x-axis. And you now see that the two pieces on the ends of the graph are actually getting very, very close to the x-axis. Again, out on the ends, it looks like they're touching the x-axis when in fact, they aren't. Now, I'd like to look at one more quick example trying to find a horizontal asymptote as we close out our lesson together. Let's look for the horizontal asymptote of y equals x to the fourth plus one over x plus one. I keep my dominant terms to find a horizontal asymptote, and that means I'm going to look at just y equals x to the fourth divided by x, which means I have y equals x cubed. Now, here's a question. As x gets really, really large, what does x cubed do? If you plug in a number like x equals one million in to x cubed, you'll get one million cubed, and that's going to get even bigger, which means in this graph's case, as we take x's that are out on the edge in either direction, the graph doesn't flatten out, it actually takes off. It either goes up to plus infinity or it goes down to minus infinity. Let me say it to you as another part of our horizontal asymptote rule. Here goes. When the dominant term on top now has higher degree than the dominant term on the bottom, then there is no horizontal asymptote. Let me say it again. If you have a rational function and the dominant term on top 
has higher degree than the dominant term on the bottom, then there will be no horizontal asymptote, which means out at the ends, the graph is not gonna flatten out. It's actually gonna take off and go either to plus infinity or minus infinity on both sides of the graph. Well, in this lesson, we've talked about the basics, just some elementary tools for graphing rational functions. We saw how to find the x-intercepts of a rational function by setting the function's numerator equal to zero and solving for x after we did our cancellations. We saw how to find vertical asymptotes for a rational function, which basically occur at the values of x where the denominator equals zero. And we saw how to find these horizontal asymptotes by looking at the ratio of the dominant term on top and the dominant term on the bottom. We're gonna continue talking about these same ideas in the next lesson when we put all of these tools together and actually sketch some graphs of rational functions from scratch. Don't worry, I'm gonna guide you through it step by step. I look forward to talking with you then. In the previous lesson, we learned about several tools that we can use to sketch the graphs of rational functions. These tools included finding x-intercepts, finding vertical asymptotes, and also finding horizontal asymptotes. If you've not nailed down the material in the previous lesson yet, you may want to go back to it for more study before you continue on to this lesson today. In this lesson, we want to bring all of those tools together to sketch the graphs of a few rational functions from scratch. You're gonna to wanna to make sure you have some graph paper handy so that we can make these sketches together. Let's get started with the following example. Sketch the graph of y equals four divided by x plus three. Now that's a pretty straightforward looking rational function, four divided by x plus three. Let's take out our tools one at a time as we begin to sketch the graph of this function. First thing I want us to look for are the x-intercepts. Now remember, sometimes these graphs have x-intercepts and sometimes they don't. So let's check to see if this one indeed does have those intercepts. Maybe it won't. We wanna look at the numerator equal to zero. Remember, that's how we always look for x-intercepts. Take the numerator and set it equal to zero. In this case, the numerator is simple, it's just four. So we're looking at the equation four equals zero. When is four ever equal to zero? Never. So in this case, there are no x-intercepts for this graph. And you might think, well, that doesn't tell me anything. It actually tells you a lot because it means that the graph will never be able to cross the x-axis. The x-axis is somehow going to act as a natural barrier for the pieces of the graph. So we're never going to cross the x-axis. And let's make a mental note of that. Next, I want us to look for those vertical asymptotes. Now, do you remember how we're going to check for vertical asymptotes? We're going to set the denominator equal to zero and then solve for x, and we'll go from there. So in this case, the denominator is not too big. It's just x plus three, and we're going to set that equal to zero. Once I've done that, I'm gonna solve that for x, and to do so, I just subtract three from both sides of the equation, and I'll be left with x equals negative three. So the line x equals negative three, which is a vertical line, serves as a vertical asymptote for this graph. Now, if you wanna start sketching the graph now, get that piece of graph paper out, sketch your x-axis, sketch your y-axis, and label those two, and now you could draw in the line x equals negative three in a dashed way. So remember, this line is actually not part of the graph, but it's serving as a bit of a guide or a wall for the pieces of the graph. So I'm gonna draw it in in a dashed fashion so that I remember that it's really not there, it's just serving as an imaginary barrier or wall uh, for the other pieces of the graph. That vertical line, x equals negative three, is our only x-intercept in this case. Now once I know that that's an x-intercept, the next question I need to ask is, what direction does the graph go on either side of that vertical asymptote? 
In other words, as the x values start to get close to negative 3 from one side or the other, the graph is going to have to either turn up or it's going to have to turn downward. And the question is, on either side of that line, which way does the graph go? So, for example, what if I were an x value that was very, very close to negative 3, but to the right of negative 3? For example, negative 2.999. Remember, on the negative side of the x-axis, negative 2.999 would actually be to the right of negative 3. As the x's are close to that negative 3, but to the right of it, like at negative 2.999, when I plug negative 2.999 into the function, I'm going to see that I actually get a positive number back because the 4 in the numerator is obviously positive. It's positive 4. And the denominator would become negative 2.999 plus 3. And if you do that arithmetic, you get positive 0 0.001. And so you really do have a positive on top divided by a positive on the bottom. And so that part of the graph is actually going to go to positive infinity as it gets really, really close to that vertical asymptote. What if the x values get close to negative 3 from the left of negative 3? Like I plug in negative 3.01, for example. Well, in that case, when you do the arithmetic, the numerator will still be positive, but the denominator now will be negative because, for example, negative 3.01 plus 3 is negative 0.01. And a positive number divided by a negative number will be negative. So what I like to do when I'm drawing these graphs is, after I've drawn that vertical asymptote, I'm going to put a little arrow on the end, somewhere above or maybe below, to remind me which time I'm going to go to positive infinity and which time I'm going to negative infinity. Again, in this case, the values coming in from the left are going to go to negative infinity, and the values coming in from the right are going to go to positive infinity. And so now I know a lot about what's happening near this vertical asymptote. I know that the pieces of the graph are going to have to behave in that fashion when I get close to that line. Now, that's the vertical asymptote stuff. There's another tool that's helping us draw this graph, and that's the horizontal asymptote. So remember how you find these horizontal asymptotes? You want to consider the equation y equals the dominant term of the top divided by the dominant term of the bottom. Well, there's only one term on top, that's 4, so you keep it. And the dominant term on the bottom is going to be the x. The x is going to grow much faster than the 3. And so you're looking at the equation y equals 4 divided by x, when you keep just the dominant terms. Notice that the degree of the numerator, in this case just the 4, is smaller than the degree of the denominator. Think of the 4 as 4 times x to the 0, then the degree of that would be 0. The degree of the denominator is 1, because I have an x to the 1. And so the degree on top is smaller than the degree on the bottom. We learned in the last lesson that that means the horizontal asymptote is at y equals 0. And that is just the x-axis. Remember we said earlier we weren't going to have any x-intercepts. It turns out, coincidentally, that the horizontal asymptote in this case is y equals 0. That is the x-axis. So I'm going to have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0, which is going to tell me what happens at the ends of the graph. The ends of the graph somehow must either come below that line or come up from above that line and get really, really close to it as I get ready to draw this graph. OK, what about the y-intercept? You know, it wouldn't hurt for us to find that point because the y-intercept is usually, usually pretty easy to find. Well, remember that the y-intercept is going to be the point where x equals 0. In other words, it's going to be the point that has coordinates 0, comma, something. So I'm going to go back to my original equation, and I'm going to let x equal 0, and I'm going to see if I can find y. Well, in the case when x is 0, I'm going to have y equals 4 divided by 0 plus 3, which, of course, is just 4 thirds. So the y-intercept on this graph is going to be 0, comma, four-thirds. And if you've got that graph paper and you've started drawing this graph, you can actually put that point right into your graph, zero comma four-thirds. Now, at this point you might be saying, yeah, but my paper is almost blank. I've got the axes drawn, I've got this one point, the y-intercept, and then we've got all this other information about where the graph can or cannot go based on the asymptotes. What are we supposed to do now? It sure doesn't look like we can draw the graph yet. Well, you do something that 
we've always known about graphing at this point, and that is we just plot some points and connect the dots. So how are we going to plot some points? We're just going to go to the function that we started with, and we're going to plug in a few values of x. We're going to draw in those points based on those values of x and the y values that correspond to those values of x, and then we're going to connect the dots. After all, that's what graphing is, plotting a bunch of points and connecting the dots. So that's what I want us to do now. I want us to plot some points on the graph and plug them in, basically. So let's do that. Let's say I plug in numbers like uh, negative 6 for x, negative 5, negative 4. How about negative 2, negative 1, and 0? Notice that I skipped over negative 3. I can't plug in negative 3 because it causes division by 0. But I can plug in some other things. So let's plug in, say, negative 6. If you plug in negative 6, you're going to get negative 4 thirds back for your y value. That's going to come from 4 divided by negative 3. So the point negative 6 comma negative 4 thirds is on your graph. OK, let's plug in negative 5. If you plug in negative 5, you'll have 4 divided by negative 5 plus 3, and that's 4 divided by negative 2, which is negative 2. So you can now plot on your graph the point negative 5 comma negative 2. Plug in negative 4 for x, and actually you get negative 4 back for y. Plug in negative 2 for x, and you'll get positive 4 back for y. And plug in negative 1 for x, let's say, and you'll have 4 divided by negative 1 plus 3, which is 4 divided by 2, which is positive 2. So you have the point on your graph negative 1 comma 2. And you already knew that if you plugged in 0 for x, you'd get 4 thirds back. And now you should have at least six points drawn in on your graph paper, and you can now start to see the shape of this graph. And with those points in mind, you can actually start to build what is your graph. Remember what happens now. As you're coming in from the left, the graph needs to be getting very, very close to the x-axis, that horizontal asymptote. As you move towards the right, you see that the points that you've already drawn in start to dip a bit. And then, as they get very, very close to that vertical asymptote, they just are going to dip down to negative infinity, basically. Then, at the other side of that vertical asymptote, x equals negative 3, remember they were going to be at positive infinity. And now you can start to see how you come down towards your y-intercept, and then go through that y-intercept, and then you're going to trail off to the right, and again get close to that horizontal asymptote. Remember what it was? It was y equals 0. And in the process, you've drawn your graph. You have the piece on the left, which is dipping down before that vertical asymptote. You have the piece on the right that comes next to it and then levels off just above the x-axis. Remember, in that case, there were no x-intercepts. We had the one y-intercept, which you should have drawn through, and you have those asymptotes, and you're done. Congratulations, you've now, from scratch, drawn what is probably your first ever graph of a rational function. So I say we move on to another one, and let's see how we do. Let's sketch the graph of this rational function. y equals 5x minus 15 divided by x plus 2. Now I want to march through the same tools again. We want to look for x-intercepts, we want to look for asymptotes, maybe plot in a few more points, and then connect the dots. So here we go. x-intercepts, what do we do? Well, after we check to see if there's any cancellation, which in this case there will not be because there's no factors in the numerator and the denominator that are the same, we're going to set that numerator equal to 0 and solve for x. So that's 5x minus 15 equals 0. Add 15 to both sides and you'll have 5x equals plus 15. Divide by 5 on both sides and you'll have x equals 3. So the x-intercept in this case is at 3 comma 0. If you haven't started yet, get out a piece of graph paper, draw your axes, and now you can draw in this one x-intercept. The graph is going to cross or at least touch the x-axis at the point 3 comma 0. While we're talking about intercepts, why don't we just find the y-intercept very, very quickly? I think that wouldn't hurt. To find the y-intercept, we're just going to plug in x equals 0 everywhere in the function. And when I do that, I'm going to have y equals 5 times 0 minus 15 divided by 0 plus 2. And that's the same as negative 15 on top divided by 2 on the bottom, which is negative 7, half, negative 7 and a half or negative 7.5. So the y-intercept is at 0 comma negative 7.5. It's going to go down below the x-axis, and you should draw that point in as well. So you actually now have two points on the graph already. 
But of course, this graph is going to be a lot more complicated. You're going to need more information than just knowing those two points. Next, what's the next tool in our toolbox for drawing uh, the graph of a rational function? We look for vertical asymptotes. In that case, we're going to take the denominator of the rational function and set it equal to zero. And so I'm going to look at x plus 2 equals zero. If I subtract 2 from both sides of that equation, I'll end up with the equation x equals negative 2. So I have one vertical asymptote. It's at x equals negative 2. Great. What happens when I get close to that vertical asymptote? This, again, is a question we have to ask ourselves. As the x values get really, really close to negative 2 from one side or from the other side, does the graph go up or does the graph go down? That's a real important question. So for a value of x that's on the right of negative 2, like negative 1.9999, the y value is going to go to negative infinity. How do you check that? You plug in negative 1.9999 for x and simplify whatever you get. You're not as worried about what the actual number is that comes out, but you are worried about what the sign of the number is that pops out. And in that case, you get a negative number. So that, that piece of the graph is going to go to negative infinity. If you plug in a value of x to the left of negative 2, like negative 2.00001, the y value you get after you plug in that x value is going to be positive. In fact, it's going to be a negative over a negative. So it's going to be positive, and that means that that side of the graph actually goes to plus infinity as we get really, really close to that vertical asymptote. So you can draw in that vertical asymptote now if you want. Draw it in as a dashed line to remind you that it's not really part of the graph, but that it's serving as a guide for the graph as we draw it in. And now let's go to the next tool, horizontal asymptotes. Well, to find the horizontal asymptote, I look at the equation y equals the most dominant term on top divided by the most dominant term on the bottom. And in that case, we're looking at the equation y equals 5x divided by x, which is the same as 5 when you cancel the x's. So the horizontal asymptote in this case is actually at y equals 5. Okay, now you know that that's also going to serve as a bit of a barrier or a guide for our graph. So if you want, you could draw in the line y equals 5, again in a dotted fashion or a dashed fashion, because it's really not part of the graph, but it is serving to help guide the graph as we draw it later on. Okay, so what have we done? We've found the uh, asymptotes, both the vertical and horizontal. And we've also found the x and y intercepts. I would suggest now that we plot some more points and draw them in. This takes a little bit of work, but finding the actual values of those points is a great idea because it helps us to see where the pieces of the graph are actually going to go. So let's plug in a few values of x. Again, you can choose any values of x you want. In this case, there probably aren't a whole lot of values of x that are going to give you really clean values for y. But let's just plug in several so that we can see what we're doing. So I'm going to suggest we plug in x equals negative 6, negative 5, negative 4, negative 3, maybe negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. Notice that I didn't suggest we plug in x equals negative 2 because we can't. It would cause division by 0 otherwise. And now if you go through and take the time to plug in these values, like negative 6, negative 5, and so on, you'll get the following. When x is negative 6, the y value is 45 divided by 4. So it's a little over 11. Uh, when x is negative 5, the y value actually gets even bigger. It's now 40 divided by 3, which is 13 and 1 third. When x is negative 4, you're going to get a y value of 35 over 2. Again, you'll have to do some simplifying to get that, but the y value will be 35 over 2. That means that the point negative 4 comma 35 over 2 is on your graph. So each time we do this, we just now found three points together, we should be plotting those on our piece of graph paper. They're very, very helpful to know. When you plug in x equals negative 3, you actually get a whole number back. You get positive 30. And now if you go over to x equals negative 1, you'll actually get negative 20. Notice there's been a shift now in the numbers. We went from positive y values to negative y values. When x is 0, we have negative 15 over 2. We already found that a few moments ago. That was our y-intercept. When x is 1, y will be negative 10 divided by 3, or negative 3 and a third. 
And when x is 2, the y value will be negative 5 fourths, or negative 1 and 1 fourth. Now, you should have plotted all of those points. I think we mentioned eight different points there, including the y-intercept. And now you should start to see almost a connect-the-dot type picture in front of you. And if you have those dots, and you remember where the vertical asymptote is, and you remember that the horizontal asymptote is at y equals 5, you can actually connect all those dots. And what's the graph going to look like? Well, it's going to come in from the left, hovering above that y, that horizontal asymptote, y equals 5. And it's going to come up, and as it gets close to that vertical asymptote, it's going to take off in the upwards direction towards plus infinity. On the other side of that vertical asymptote, it's going to start down low. It's going to come across. It's going to cross its y-intercept. Then it's going to cross its x-intercept. And then it's going to hover just below that horizontal asymptote, y equals 5. And so we see here a graph that's similar to the previous one. You have two pieces, again, making these sort of bending shapes, but we have to remember that they have to get close to those asymptotes in the process. Once we see those asymptotes as sort of barriers to where the graph goes, it actually helps us to draw in the pieces of the graph. Okay, we've looked at two examples. Now I'd like to look at a third one which is a, has a little more complication to it. Not a lot, but just a bit. Uh, thankfully, all we really have to do is go through the same tools and the same techniques again in order to complete the example. But this one is a little bit different, so let's go ahead and look at it now. I want us to sketch the graph of y equals x squared minus 1 over x squared minus 4. Okay, that's a slightly more complicated rational function than the ones we've seen before. Notice, for example, the degree on top and the degree on the bottom are both 2. That's a little bit bigger than the degrees were in the earlier examples. The first thing I want to do is factor to see if there are any cancellations that take place. That's very important. In this case, though, you won't see any because the numerator factors as x minus 1 times x plus 1, and the denominator factors as x minus 2 times x plus 2. So there's no cancellations to worry about. And that means we can roll right into our tools and start gathering information that we can use in order to graph this rational function. So what's the first tool? X-intercepts. How do we find the x-intercepts? We're going to set the numerator equal to 0. In this case, that means we're looking at x minus 1 times x plus 1 equal to 0. That means x minus 1 equals 0 or x plus 1 equals 0. And that means that x is either 1 or x is equal to negative 1. Hey, that means we have actually two x-intercepts in this example, not just 1 or 0 like we had before. In this case now, two x-intercepts will be 1 comma 0 and negative 1 comma 0. So let's get out a new piece of, of graph paper. Let's draw our axes and label them and then plot the points 1, 0 and negative 1, 0 because the graph has to go through those two points. Now, as I've said before, the y-intercept you can usually get pretty easily. So while we're talking about intercepts, let's just see if we can find the y-intercept. To find the y-intercept, you're going to set the x equal to 0 and then solve for the y. So in this case, I'm going to have y equals 0 squared minus 1 divided by 0 squared minus 4, which is just 0 minus 1 over 0 minus 4, which is negative 1 over negative 4, and the negatives cancel to give you 1 fourth. So the y-intercept is at the point 0, 1 fourth. It's just barely above the origin. So let's go ahead and draw that dot in as well. That y-intercept is very important. We now know three points on the graph of this uh, function. Once we know that, we should move to another tool. Let's gather some information about the asymptotes now. So let's start with the vertical asymptotes. Now, how do we find vertical asymptotes? Well, we take the denominator and set it equal to 0. That's what we've done in all the other examples we've looked at. So in this case, that's going to be x minus 2 times x plus 2 equals 0, which is the same as x minus 2 equals 0 or x plus 2 equals 0, which is x equals 2 or x equals negative 2. So in this case, I have two vertical asymptotes as well. They're going to happen at x equals 2 and x equals negative 2. So you can imagine both of these now are going to serve as walls or guides for the pieces of the graph, which means there may be even more than two pieces of graph in the process. We might have three of them, one on one side, one on the other side, and one in the middle between the two vertical asymptotes. We'll have to see.
So you might want to draw in those two vertical asymptotes at this point as dotted lines, just to make sure you remember that they're both there to serve as uh, barriers for the other pieces of the graph. Now, once we know those vertical asymptotes, we have to ask, what happens on either side of them? Because the graphs could be doing all sorts of different things next to those vertical asymptotes. It could be going up on one side and down on the other, up on both sides, you never know. So let's walk through very quickly what happens with this function near the vertical asymptotes. Well, what happens if you're near x equal to 2? Let's say you're plugging in something like uh, 2.1. So if x equals 2 is the vertical line here, then x equals 2.1 is going to be just on its right. If you plug in 2.1 for x, you'll have 2.1 squared minus 1 divided by 2.1 squared minus 4. Well, the numerator is clearly going to be positive because it's something like 4.41 minus 1. So it's going to be a positive number. The denominator is also positive because 2.1 squared is slightly bigger than 4. And then when you subtract 4, you'll be slightly bigger than 0. So you'll be positive. So when x is near, near 2 but on its right, you're going to have a positive divided by a positive, And that's going to give you a positive number. That means as the graph comes towards the x equals 2 line on the right, it's going to go up because we found a positive number earlier. Now, if you let x get close to that positive 2 from the left, like 1.9, let's say, if you plug that into the original function, the numerator will still be positive. 1.9 squared minus 1 is definitely going to be a positive number. But the denominator will be negative because 1.9 squared is slightly less than 4. And when you subtract 4 then, you'll get a negative number back. So plugging in x equals 1.9 is going to give you a positive divided by a negative for the y value, and that's going to be negative. So as the graph gets close to x equals 2 from the left, you're going to see that it dips down. So near that, uh, near that vertical asymptote x equals 2, one side is going to go up, and the other side is going to go down. You could do a similar sort of thing with the vertical asymptote x equals negative 2. And in fact, what you would see is that the side coming in from the left would actually go up in this case, and the side coming in from the right of that vertical asymptote would go down. So the graph is going to have to go up like this and down like this near the x equals negative 2 vertical asymptote. And then near the x equals 2 vertical asymptote, it's going to go down and then up. So we're going to get some very interesting shapes for the pieces of the graph. But bottom line, as long as we can remember where they have to end up at the end, near the asymptotes, we can actually draw in all the pieces. OK? So now, that's the vertical asymptote. Let's talk about the horizontal asymptote pretty quickly. It's not that hard to do. In the horizontal asymptote case, we're going to take y equals dominant term on top divided by dominant term on the bottom. That means y equals x squared divided by x squared. Well, the x squareds cancel, and you just get 1. So the horizontal asymptote here is going to be the line y equals 1. And so we now know that we have two vertical asymptotes, and we have this horizontal asymptote that's going to be at y equals 1. We've got those as pieces to help us remember where the parts of the graph will go. And now we should plot a few points. So let's do that here. Again, we need to plug in some values of x. And you can choose whichever values you want. I would plot several in this case, because apparently we have maybe even three pieces of graph. And if you start plotting your points, let's say x equals negative 6, plugging in x equals negative 6 is going to give you y equals 35 divided by 32 after you simplify everything. Plugging in negative 6 for x is going to give you uh, 36 minus 1, which is 35 divided by 36 minus 4, which is 32. So when x is negative 6, y is 35 over 32, just barely above 1, basically. When x is negative 5, you're going to get 8 over 7 after you cancel everything out, after you simplify. So that's another point on the graph, negative 5 comma 8 over 7. And when x is negative 4, you're going to get 5 fourths back for your y value. So you can plot that point as well. When x is negative 3, you'll get 8 fifths 
I want you to notice that a lot of these points are very, very close to one, actually, in their Y value. So they're all kind of close together in terms of those Y values. When X is something like three, you'll get eight fifths back. When X is four, you get five fourths for Y. When X is five, you get eight sevenths. And when X is six, you get 35 over 32 again. And now you should have points on this graph that you can actually connect, so to speak. But remember, don't cross the vertical asymptotes. They're acting like barriers. So you've got all these points, but now as you connect them, you have to remember to behave, so to speak, around those vertical asymptotes correctly. And if you start to connect those points and so on, you're gonna see the following. As the graph comes in from the left, it's gonna come in somewhat flat. It's trying to stay very close to that horizontal asymptote, remember. And then it's going to take off in the positive infinity direction near the vertical asymptote. That makes perfect sense. Then, just after the vertical asymptote x equals negative two, remember it had to go down. As it's moving left to right, it's gonna come up. It's gotta go through that x intercept. Don't forget it's there. It's also gonna go through the y intercept. And then it's gotta come back down to get to the other x intercept. And then it's gotta behave next to the vertical asymptote. And that means that the middle part of this graph, so to speak, is an upside down U shape that's staying very, very close to the two vertical asymptotes. And then on the other side of x equals two, you're gonna have another piece going up high. And so it's gonna start high near the vertical asymptote x equals two, and then it's gonna flatten out and stay right above the horizontal asymptote. It never crosses that at the end, it just stays right above it. Now you might say to me, I would have never seen that U shape in the middle. The two pieces on the outsides, I could have seen that if I just plotted all the points that you gave me, but I don't think I could have seen the U shape. Let me suggest that if you ever have a part of this graph, or any graph, that you're not sure about, plug in more values of X. You can always get more points, you can always plot them, and you can just connect the dots. And in that way, you'll be able to see what the graph actually looks like. Well, in today's lesson, we've talked about how to actually draw the graphs of various rational functions from scratch. And we used all kinds of tools, intercepts, X and Y intercepts, as well as vertical and horizontal asymptotes. I know it probably felt like a lot to do each problem. And to be honest with you, some of these problems can take some time. Be patient with them, gather all the information, and then think through what the information is telling you as you draw the graphs. In the next lesson, we're actually going to shift gears quite a bit, and we're going to start talking about radical expressions. I'll see you then. In some of our earlier lessons, especially the lessons that dealt with quadratic functions and the Pythagorean theorem, radical expressions showed up. What do I mean by a radical expression? Well, anytime you see a root symbol, like the square root symbol, then you're looking at something we call a radical symbol. And therefore, we would have a radical expression if we had a square root in it. In this lesson, I wanna talk more about radical expressions how to simplify them, and how to perform operations on them like multiplication and division, addition and subtraction. We've already done some work along these lines, but here I want us to take the topic much further. As I've emphasized in some of our earlier lessons, it's extremely important that we know our arithmetic facts in order to quickly simplify these radical expressions. So let's start by spending some time just simplifying some of these radical expressions, and you'll see what I mean about arithmetic facts coming into play. Let's simplify the square root of 162. Now, one question you should ask is, how do I start the process of simplifying a square root like that? Well, just as we've done with some of the other lessons, we want to start by factoring 162. And in particular, if I can find a perfect square factor hiding inside of 162, I'll know that I can take that off or peel it off as part of the square root. So, for example, if I started factoring 162, I'd probably take out a two first because I see that 162 is even. At that point, I would know that 162 equals two times 81. 
I could find that 81 by some long division if I had to, just doing two goes into 162 with some long division. And once I see that 81, I should stop. If I know my arithmetic, I know that 81 is a perfect square because it's nine times nine. I'm gonna stop factoring at that point because that 81 is a nice perfect square. And since 162 equals two times 81, I know that square root of 162 equals the square root of two times 81. And now that square root can be pulled into two square roots multiplied together. In other words, it's the same as square root of two times square root of 81. But the square root of 81 is nine, and therefore I would have the square root of two times a nine. Typically, we're gonna take that whole number nine and move it out to the front of the square root of two. And therefore, my final answer would be nine times the square root of two. And that's the simplification of the square root of 162. Square root 162 equals nine times the square root of two. Let's try a second example in the same way. Let's simplify the square root of 80 x to the seventh. We might as well throw a variable in there. In the previous example, we were just dealing with some numbers. So now I wanna be able to simplify or whittle down the square root of 80 times x to the seventh as much as I can. Again, the idea is I wanna look at perfect squares that could be inside either the 80 or the x to the seventh. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is immediately split the square root of 80 x to the seventh into two square roots. The square root of 80 times the square root of x to the seventh. By doing that, I've actually split the problem into two little pieces, the square root of 80 and the square root of x to the seventh. And I can handle them separately, and then at the end, just multiply everything together. So let's start by looking at the square root of 80. Let's start factoring it and see if we can factor in such a way that we see some perfect squares hiding inside of 80. So 80 is equal to two times 40, and that's equal to two times two times 20, and that's equal to two times two times two times 10, and then the 10 can be whittled down as another two times five, and that means that 80 is equal to two times two times two times two times five. We can't factor that down any farther. Now the question is, are there any perfect squares inside there? And the answer is yes, if you look at those twos that are out in front of the factorization. In fact, I could rewrite my factorization now as 16 times five, if I just multiply back up the two times two times two times two. And why would I multiply those up to give me 16? Because 16 is a perfect square. I know that 16 is four times four. And therefore, I can rewrite the square root of 80 in this way. Square root of 80 equals square root of 16 times five, and I can split that up into square root of 16 times square root of five, and the square root of 16 is just four. And so the square root of 80 would just be four times the square root of five. You're not gonna be able to simplify square root of five at all. And so I've simplified square root of 80 as four times the square root of five. Now, I need to look at that other square root, which was the square root of x to the seventh. We're not finished yet until we look at that piece as well. I've gotta think about how to write x to the seventh to pull out any square, perf perfect squares that are hiding inside of it. Well. Let me point something out. X to the seventh is the same as X to the sixth times X to the first, because six plus one is seven. Remember, when you multiply these kinds of things, you add the exponents. Now, why did I peel off X to the sixth like that? Well, because X to the sixth is a perfect square. X to the sixth equals X cubed times X cubed, or X cubed whole thing squared. And therefore, by peeling apart the x to the six and the x, I can simplify the square root of x to the seventh as square root of x to the sixth times x, which is square root of x to the sixth times the square root of x, and the square root of x to the sixth is just x cubed. And therefore, square root of x to the seventh is x cubed times the extra square root of x. Now, I have to take these pieces and glue them back together, so let's do it. Square root of 80 x to the seventh is exactly square root of 80 times square root of x to the seventh. But from the work we just did, I now know that that's four times the square root of five times x cubed square root of x. Now typically we're gonna take all the stuff that's not a square root and put it out in front, 
and then put all the square roots together. And that means I could rewrite everything as 4x cubed times the square root of 5 times the square root of x. And if I want, I could put those two square roots together, and my final answer would be 4x cubed times the square root of 5x. That's as simple as you're going to get the original problem to look. Now, the next question we should ask is this. What if we wanted to perform operations on radical expressions, like adding them, multiplying them, and so on? How are such expressions simplified? Well, that's a good question. So I want to start doing some examples with some operations. And it turns out that multiplication and division are actually easier to do with square roots than addition and subtraction, believe it or not. So I'm going to start with some examples that are multiplication or division first. We'll look at some addition and subtraction later on. Let's do the following. Simplify square root of 98x to the fifth times the square root of 18x cubed. Okay, let's start by simplifying each piece separately as much as we can, and then we'll see if we can actually simplify later on after we've done this first step. So the first thing I want to do is the square root of 98x to the fifth. Well, 98x to the fifth, ignoring the square root for just a second, is the same as 2 times 49, that's the 98 part, times an x to the fourth times x. Now, I've written it that way because you'll see in a moment that I'm seeing some perfect squares in there, like that 49. It's 7 squared. And as soon as I see that, I can start to peel out pieces of this square root, which are going to allow me to get rid of some of the square root symbols. So here we go. Square root of 98x to the fifth is square root of 2 times 49 times x to the fourth times x. Each of those can now be separated into their own square root, and I'll have square root of 2, square root of 49, square root of x to the fourth, and square root of x all multiplied together. But the square root of 49 is 7, so I can just pull that 7 out in front, and the square root of x to the fourth is exactly x squared, because x squared times x squared is x to the fourth. And therefore, this first piece, square root of 98x to the fifth, can be simplified as 7x squared times the square root of 2x. Okay, now let's look at the other piece in the original problem, square root of 18x cubed. Well, 18x cubed can be written as 2 times 9 times x squared times x. Again, you could write this in a lot of different ways, but I'm trying to write it so that I can see some perfect squares hiding inside 18x cubed as factors. And by writing 18x cubed as 2 times 9 times x squared times x, I see that the square root of 18x cubed equals the square root of 2 times the square root of 9 times the square root of x squared times the square root of x. And the square root of 9 is the same as 3. I can just pull that out in front. And the square root of x squared is the same as x because x times x equals x squared. So I can pull an x out in front, and what I'm left with is a square root of a 2 and a square root of x, which I can't really simplify. So the square root of 18x cubed, I'm going to rewrite as 3 times x times square root of 2x. Now, the problem started with me wanting to multiply these two larger terms and simplify as much as possible. So now let's take the two simplifications that we've already written down, and multiply those together, and then see if there's any more simplification that we can do. So, we have square root of 98x to the fifth times square root of 18x cubed. That equals 7x squared times the square root of 2x times 3x times the square root of 2x. That's what we found earlier. And now let's start multiplying things together. The 7 times the 3 gives me a 21. The x squared times the x gives me an x cubed. And now the two square roots can be recombined, and when I multiply them together, I get square root of 4x squared. 4 coming from the 2 times 2, and the x squared coming from the x times x. But wait a minute, 4x squared is a perfect square because 2x times 2x is 4x squared. And that means that the square root of 4x squared can be rewritten as 2x. So this whole thing simplifies as 21x cubed times 2x. And now I can just multiply that out just a little bit more. 21 times 2 is 42. x cubed times x is x to the fourth. And so my final answer is 42x to the fourth. And now I want you to notice something about this problem before we move on. We started with 
a product of, a multiplication of two pretty ugly looking square roots to start, and the answer has no square roots in it at all. It just ended up being 42x to the fourth. Is that a problem? Absolutely not. It's a perfectly good answer. It just meant that when we simplified, everything cleaned up nicely and there were no square roots left. Okay, now let's move to an example where we do a division that involves square roots. Again, division and multiplication actually are relatively clean compared to addition and subtractions with square roots. So I want to look at a, a simplification problem now with division in it. So let's look at square root of 75t to the ninth divided by 12t cubed. Now, the square root of a fraction like that is the same as the square root of the numerator divided by the square root of the denominator. We're allowed to split a square root of a fraction into two square roots divided by one another. And so my problem is the same as the square root of 75t to the ninth divided by the square root of 12t cubed. By the way, you could also just simplify what's inside the square root symbol to begin with and then go from there. But I'm choosing in this example, just so I can show you different things, to split this into two square roots and then do the simplification there. So let's look just at the numerator now. Square root of 75t to the ninth. Well, 75t to the ninth is the same as 3 times 25 times the t to the ninth. So I know immediately that I can take square root of 75t to the ninth and rewrite it as square root of 3 times square root of 25 times square root of t to the ninth. The square root of 25 will pop out in front as a 5, right? Because 5 times 5 is 25. So I can rewrite that as 5 square root of 3 times the square root of t to the ninth. But the t to the ninth can be rewritten as t to the eighth times t. It's kind of the same trick we were using in the earlier example. And at that point, I'll split the square root of t to the ninth into square root of t to the eighth times the square root of t. Why? Because the square root of t to the eighth is a perfect square. It's t to the fourth. Because t to the fourth times t to the fourth is t to the eighth. And therefore, this thing simplifies as 5 times t to the fourth times the square root of 3 times the square root of t. There was an extra t at the end. And so this is simple, simply 5t to the fourth times the square root of 3t. That's the numerator. Now, let's look at the denominator quickly. Square root of 12t cubed. I'm going to write the 12 as 3 times 4. I could have written it as 2 times 6, but neither 2 nor 6 is a perfect square. So that's a pretty useless way of writing 12. But 12 being written as 3 times 4 is helpful because 4 is a perfect square. So let's rewrite the square root of 12t cubed as square root of 3 times square root of 4 times the square root of t cubed. That square root of 4 is a 2, so let's just pull a 2 out in front of everything, and we'll have 2 times the square root of 3 times the square root of t cubed. Okay, let's think about how to write this t cubed. Let's write it as t squared times t so that we can get at least part of it to be a perfect square. And at that point, we'll have 2 times square root of 3 times square root of t squared times square root of t. The square root of t squared is just t because t times t equals t squared. And so this all simplifies as 2t times the square root of 3 times the square root of t or 2t times the square root of 3t. And that means the original problem now is just equal to 5t to the fourth square root of 3t on the top divided by 2t square root of 3t on the bottom. Notice something. I have a square root of 3t on the top as a factor. I have a square root of 3t on the bottom as a factor. What can I do with them? Cancel them. Get rid of them as quickly as you can. And you'll be left with 5t to the fourth divided by 2t, which will cancel just a little bit more. You can get rid of 1t on the top and bottom. And you're left with 5t cubed divided by 2. And that's your simplification. Let's look at a second example really quickly with division just to show a little more of this simplification. Let's simplify 5 square root of 2 divided by square root of 25x. Now, to start, I see that my denominator is exactly the same as 5 times the square root of x because 25 is just 5 times 5. So I would have 5 times the square root of 2 divided by 5 times the square root of x. And of course, the 5s can be canceled at that point. And so I would just have 
square root of 2 divided by square root of x. At this point, I have to share an important comment that's related to these kinds of problems. It's often the case that textbooks and even math teachers do not want us to leave a radical symbol, like the square root symbol, in the denominator. Uh, in my opinion, this is more of a preference than it is a mathematical requirement. But even so, I'd like to use this example to walk through what to do to get rid of that square root in the denominator, because some of you will have teachers or you'll read in textbooks that you're supposed to be getting rid of any square roots in the denominators. So we're now going to do what's called rationalizing the denominator. I know it's a big phrase, but that's exactly what we do in order to get rid of that denominator square root. Let's rationalize the denominator. Well, what you do to do that is multiply the numerator and the denominator of your fraction by some expression which will remove the radical symbol from the denominator. In this case, I want us to multiply both the top and the bottom by the square root of x. So here's what you'd have to do. You'd have square root of 2 divided by square root of x, that's what you started with, and you would then multiply by the fraction square root of x over square root of x. Now, square root of x over square root of x is just 1, right? Because they have the same numerator and denominator. But once you do that multiplication, what do you get? Well, you get square root of 2 times the square root of x on the top, divided by square root of x times square root of x on the bottom. And that means the top is just square root of 2x, but the bottom is now square root of x squared. And that's just x. And therefore, your final answer is actually square root of 2x divided by x. Notice what you've done. You've gotten rid of the radical symbol in the denominator. There is no square root in the denominator any longer, and that means you've rationalized the denominator. Okay, so we've done multiplication and we've done some division. Why don't we look at adding and subtracting with radicals now, and let's just see what the main points are as we walk through it. First of all, the key to these kinds of additions and subtractions is to look for like terms. We've heard that phrase a lot, haven't we? In this case, you're going to be looking for things like 3 times square root of 2 plus 5 times square root of 2. Those are going to be like terms because they both are just some square roots of 2 being added together, just like 3 bananas and 5 bananas would give you 8 bananas. So we're going to be looking for like terms like that as we do these additions and subtractions. So 3 square root of 2 plus 5 square root of 2 would actually be 8 times the square root of 2. That would work fine. What if you had 3 square root of 7 plus 4 times the square root of 2? In that case, you can't simplify at all because the square root of 7 and the square root of 2 they're both square roots, but they're very different square roots, just like apples and oranges are very different fruits, even though they're both fruits. So 3 square root of 7 plus 4 square root of 2 would not be simplifiable at all. You'd have to leave it as it is. So let's look at some examples now of trying to simplify these sorts of additions and subtractions. Let's start with the following. Simplify 11 square root of 3 minus square root of 12. Now, you might start out by saying, well, square root of 3 and square root of 12, they've got different numbers under the radical symbol, so you just told me that they're not like terms, and therefore I can't do anything about it. Well, you're right in saying that 3 and 12 are different numbers, but before we start to finish the example by doing nothing to it, we should see if there's any simplifying of each individual square root, and maybe, just maybe, like terms will pop up. Let me show you what I mean. That square root of 12 that's in the original problem is the same as square root of 4 times 3. So I can split that into square root of 4 times square root of 3, and of course square root of 4 is just 2. So I really have 2 times the square root of 3. What that means is I can replace the square root of 12 in the start of the problem with 2 times the square root of 3. And the problem then becomes 11 square root of 3 minus 2 square root of 3. Guess what? we now have like terms. And so we have 11 things minus 2 things. That means we're left with 9 things. And in fact, 11 square root of 3 minus 2 square root of 3 is exactly 9 square root of 3. So be careful. It may not look like you have any like terms, but in fact, they may be hiding underneath waiting for you to find them. Now, let's do another example, same kind of thing. Let's simplify 13 times the square root of 5 minus 3 square root of 125 plus 
square root of 100. Okay, let's start by simplifying each square root to see if we can do any sort of like term sorts of things. Well, the square root of 5 at the beginning, I can't do anything with that, so let's leave it alone. The square root of 125, okay, I've got to do my arithmetic now. I need to find a square in there, if there is one. And 125 is equal to 25 times 5. Well, 25 is a perfect square, and so I can split that into square root of 25 times square root of 5. The square root of 25 is 5, and so I have 5 times the square root of 5. So the second term can be written as 3 times the square root of 125 equals 3 times 5 square root of 5, or 15 square root of 5. Perfect. Now I see that the first two terms really did have like terms. We'll come back to that in a second. The third term is square root of 100, which of course is 10, because 10 times 10 is 100. And what I want you to notice there is that there's no square root of 5 attached to it. It's just flat out 10. So what you have with the original problem is the following. 13 square root of 5 minus 3 square root of 125 plus square root of 100 equals 13 square root of 5 minus 15 square root of 5 plus 10. Now those first two terms have like terms in them because they both have a square root of 5. 13 square root of 5 minus 15 square root of 5 is negative 2 square root of 5. And that means your final answer is negative 2 square root of 5 plus 10. I want you to notice that the 10 cannot be combined with the other piece because one of the terms has a square root of 5 in it and the other one doesn't. They're not like terms any longer. So your final answer is negative 2 square root of 5 plus 10. Now, I'd like to look at another example which will highlight a very important common pitfall that you see sometimes when I'm working with students on these kinds of things. So here's the example. I want us to simplify square root of 3 plus square root of 5. That's it. That's all I want to do. Simplify square root of 3 plus square root of 5. Now, I've known some students who will say that the square root of 3 plus the square root of 5 equals the square root of 3 plus 5, which is the square root of 8, and then they'll start to simplify from there, pull out a 4, and so on. Unfortunately, the first step in that logic to say that the square root of 3 plus the square root of 5 is the same as the square root of 3 plus 5 is completely wrong. You can't add across the square root symbols. So, in fact, square root of 3 plus the square root of 5 is as simple as it gets. And it is not equal. It is not equal to the square root of 3 plus 5. So, in fact, the example I just gave you can't be simplified anymore. The final answer would have to be square root of 3 plus the square root of 5. Of course, you can multiply across square root symbols, right? Square root of 3 times the square root of 27 is the same as square root of 3 times 27. And you could do manipulations with that. That would be the same as square root of 81, and that would be 9. All of that mathematics was fine. I can multiply inside and through the square root symbols. I cannot add, though, and I can't subtract across those square root symbols. So be very, very careful as you're working through these kinds of problems. You don't want to mix up what you are and are not allowed to do. Now, we've done some multiplications and divisions, some additions and subtractions, but we kind of did them separately. So the next thing I'd like to do is actually mix in some of these operations together. And to do that, let's look at this example. Let's simplify the following. Square root of 3 times the quantity 5 times the square root of 3 plus 7. Now, how would you start to simplify that kind of an expression? Well, what you're going to need to do is take the square root of 3 that's on the outside and multiply it through with all the terms on the inside of the parentheses. Do you know which property we use in order to do that? It's called the distributive property. We've talked about the distributive property before in, the, in this course. So, in this case, let's distribute the square root of 3 into the parentheses. Well, to do that, I'm going to have square root of 3 times the 5 square root of 3 plus square root of 3 times 7. And if I look at that for a moment, I realize that that's the same as 5 times the square root of 3 times 3 plus 7 times the square root of 3. And 5 times square root of 3 times 3 is the same as 5 times square root of 9. And that is just 5 times 3, because the square root of 9 is 3. And so this simplifies to 5 times 3 plus 7 times the square root of 3. 
And of course, five times three is 15. And so our final answer is 15 plus seven square root of three. Again, you can't simplify that any farther because the 15 doesn't have any square root of threes in it, and the other term does have a square root of three in it. So we can't take that any further. We can only go to that point, and we can't simplify any farther. Okay, now I'd like to do another example where we mix up some additions and subtractions with some multiplications. In this case, I'd like to expand the following. Two times the square root of seven plus square root of five, that's gonna be one thing, and then I'm gonna multiply that with square root of seven minus square root of five. Believe it or not, if you look at that for a while, you'll realize it's an example of foiling. Even though you don't have any letters in there, any variables, you have one thing plus another thing times one thing minus another thing. So you're going to just foil the pieces and see what you get. So let's foil these together. You've got two square root of seven plus square root of five times square root of seven minus square root of five. When I do that, the F part of the FOIL will give me two square root of seven times square root of seven. The O will be minus two square root of seven times square root of five. The I, the inner pieces, will be plus square root of five times square root of seven. And the L will be minus square root of five times square root of five. That was just FOIL. And now all you need to do is simplify. Well, two square root of seven times square root of seven is just two times seven because the square root of seven times the square root of seven is square root of 49, which is seven. So the first term simplifies to two times seven. The second term is minus two square root of 35. The third term is plus square root of 35. Those 35s are coming from five times seven. And the last term is minus five because square root of five times square root of five is the square root of 25, which is five. So what you really have is 14, minus two square root of 35, plus square root of 35, minus five. And the 14 minus five that are on the ends can actually be combined together to just give you nine. And the two middle terms are like terms because they both have a square root of 35 in them. You have negative two square root of 35 plus one square root of 35, and that equals negative one square root of 35. And so your final answer in this example is nine minus square root of 35. Now, I'd like to look at a very special example of foiling very quickly with you as we close out this lesson together. Here it is. Let's expand square root of three plus square root of 11 times square root of three minus square root of 11. Well, notice that the two terms look a lot alike. The, the first set of parentheses has a plus sign. The second set of parentheses has a minus sign. Otherwise, all the numbers are the same. Uh, when you have a square root plus a square root and then a square root, the same square root minus another square root. In this case, square root of three plus square root of 11 and square root of three minus square root of 11. When they just differ by their middle uh, sign in the middle, you have what are called conjugates of one another. I wanna see what happens when I actually multiply these things out. Square root of three plus square root of 11 times square root of three minus square root of 11. I'm gonna foil again, so let's do the foil. First, I'm gonna have square root of three times square root of three then minus square root of three times square root of 11, plus the inner parts, square root of 11 times square root of three, and then minus square root of 11 times square root of 11. Let's simplify. When you simplify, you'll just get three as the first term, minus square root of 33 plus square root of 33 minus 11. Now, let's combine like terms. Look at the two middle terms, minus square root of 33 plus square root of 33. What are they gonna do? They're gonna cancel. They become zero because you have minus one of them plus one of them. And that means all you're left with is three minus 11, which is negative eight. And notice what happened. You started with a problem that had a whole bunch of square roots floating around. And by the end of it, when you simplified, all of the square roots disappeared. And the reason that is, is because you were basically looking at a difference of two squares when you started the process. We talked about difference of two squares over a number of different lessons in this course. So it's a really cool application of difference of two squares. Well, in today's lesson, we've spent a lot of time getting comfortable, I hope, with radical expressions, with simplifying them, and also looking at how to add, subtract, and multiply, and divide them. We'll continue talking about radical expressions as we move into our next lesson together. I'll see you then.
In our previous lesson, we studied radical expressions and how to combine and simplify those kinds of expressions. I want us to continue studying the algebra related to radicals by solving equations which contain such radical expressions in this lesson. We're going to call those kinds of equations radical equations. But before we jump to the examples, I need to mention a very important fact that we're going to use throughout the lesson. And that fact is this. Whenever x is greater than or equal to 0, the square root of x squared equals x. So you have square root of x, whole thing squared, equaling x, as long as x is greater than or equal to 0. Now, I want you to notice that this fact is not true when x is negative. And the reason for that is the square root on the left does not make sense if you try to plug in an x that is negative. Right? The square root of negative 9 doesn't make any sense. And so the fact that I've shared with you, square root of x squared equals x, is only true as long as x is greater than or equal to 0. But I'm going to use that often as we walk through today's lesson. So let's get started with a, a straightforward example just to illustrate the approach we have in solving these kinds of radical equations. Here's the example. Let's solve the equation square root of x minus 7 equals 2. Now, notice that the minus 7 is not underneath the square root symbol. That would be a very different equation. Here, the minus 7 is actually separate from, it's basically telling us to subtract 7 from the square root of x. So don't put that minus 7 underneath the square root symbol. That would be very different. The first thing I'm going to do in solving any of these kinds of equations in this lesson is to do what I like to call isolating the radical. In other words, I want to get that square root symbol by itself on one side of the equation. And if I can, put everything else on the other side of the equation. In this case, I can do that. And the way I want to isolate the radical is by adding 7 to both sides of the equation. The left-hand side will then just be square root of x. And the right-hand side will become 2 plus 7, or 9. And so our equation that we started with is now the same as square root of x equals 9. And now we have isolated that radical. We've got it by itself. Once we have done that, we now square both sides of the equation. And I'm going to use that fact that I mentioned just a moment ago at the beginning of the lesson. And when I do, and I square both sides of the equation, I'm going to simply have x on the left-hand side equals 9 squared, or x equals 81. So my solution in this example is 81. Now, it's going to be very, very important in this lesson that we check our answers. I've been saying this throughout the course, that we should always stop when we can and check to make sure that our work is correct at the end of each problem. In this example, it's extremely important that we check our answers. And that's because even if we do all the math perfectly fine, there will be times when some numbers tell us their solutions when they're really not. So let's check our answer here just to make sure that 81 really is a solution to the problem. We go back to the original equation, square root of x minus 7 equals 2, and we plug in 81 for x. And when we do that, we'll have square root of 81 minus 7 equals 2. Square root of 81 is 9, and so what I really have is 9 minus 7 equals 2, or 2 equals 2. And of course, 2 does equal 2. That's a check, and that means that 81 really is a solution of that equation. So we're good to go there. Now, let's look at another quick example of solving a radical equation. And here it is. Let's solve square root of t minus 2 equals 5. And we're going to solve that in this case for the variable t. There's no x's here, but the variable is t. So we're going to solve for t. Now, I want you to notice a couple things before we even get started. First of all, notice that the square root is already isolated. In other words, the left-hand side of the equation is just a big square root symbol. So we don't have to do anything in this case in terms of isolating the radical. Secondly, I want you to notice that the minus 2 is actually under the radical symbol this time. Whereas in the first example, that minus 7 was on the outside. Here, minus 2 really is underneath that radical symbol. That's very, very important. Then. What I need to worry about is, at this point, squaring both sides of the equation. I'm going to use the fact that we had, that we talked about at the beginning of the lesson, 
and I'm just gonna square both sides. So here we go. I've got the radical isolated on the left-hand side already, and so we simply do that squaring. And when I do, I'm going to have square root of t minus two, whole thing squared, equals five squared. And as long as I remember now that t minus two needs to be non-negative, in other words, it has to be greater than or equal to zero, I know that the square root of t minus two squared just equals t minus two. And the right-hand side is 25. I like to think of it this way. When I take a square root and I square it, it's as if the squaring and the square rooting sort of cancel one another out. And when they undo each other like that, I'm just left with what's underneath the radical sign. In this case, that's t minus two. So my equation has become t minus two equals 25. 25 coming from five squared. And now how do I solve for t? Well, this is just reminiscent of our linear equations lessons several lessons ago. That's all this is as a linear equation. t minus two equals 25. I add two to both sides. And when I do, I get t on the left-hand side equals 25 plus two, which is 27. So my final answer in this example is t equals 27. But again, I have got to check to make sure it really is a solution. In this lesson, that's going to be important. So let's go back to the original equation and plug in t equals 27. The original equation was square root of t minus two equals five. Plugging in 27 for t gives me square root of 27 minus two equals five. The left-hand side simplifies to square root of 25, and that, of course, is five. And so I have the equation five equals five, and that works. And therefore, I really do have a solution there, and everything was fine. Now, before I go to the next example, I wanna ask a quick question about the example we just did. We started with square root of t minus two equals five. Some of you might be asking, well, why wasn't t equals negative 23 a solution to this equation? After all, if I plug in negative 23 for t, I'd have negative 23 minus two, and that's negative 25, and I know that the square root of 25 is five. So why isn't t equal negative 23 a solution? Well, it's because of that little negative sign out in front of the 23. In fact, if you do plug in negative 23, what you're really saying is that the square root of negative 25 equals five. You can't lose those signs. And the square root of negative 25 isn't five. In fact, that negative sign underneath the square root causes a huge problem because the square root of a negative number does not exist as a real number. There is no real number that you can multiply with itself to give you negative 25. That's exactly what a square root is. It's a number that you multiply by itself or with itself to give you the number under the square root symbol. Just like square root of 49 equals seven because seven times seven equals 49. But what real number would you multiply with itself to give you negative 49? There just isn't such a number. So square root of negative 25 is not equal to five because of that negative sign. And therefore t equals negative 23 is not a solution because it's gonna give you a negative number inside the square root symbol. Okay, so let's watch those uh, signs carefully and let's work on this next example then to see how we would solve the following equation. Let's solve square root of x plus three equals square root of five x minus nine. Now, I think this is an interesting kind of equation because in the earlier comments I said, let's start by isolating the radical. And by that I mean getting the radical all by itself. Unfortunately here, there are actually two different radical symbols. So it's a little hard to isolate the radical because there isn't just the radical, there are actually two of them. So what do we do? We just quit, we throw up our hands? No, don't worry about it at all. What you don't want to do is move both of the square root symbols to one side or the other. You should keep them separate and just not worry about this isolating the radical. In fact, all you really wanna do is start by squaring both sides. Okay, so when we see two square roots like this, we don't wanna put them together on the same side of the equation. We leave them separate and we simply move on to the step that squares both sides. 
Let's do that. We start with square root of x plus 3 equaling square root of 5x minus 9, and we square both sides. And when we do, the squaring uh, kills off or cancels out the square rooting. And so all you're left with is x plus 3 equals 5x minus 9. And that is a linear equation, and we have solved these kinds of equations several times before. So let's go ahead and solve this linear equation now. We're going to have x plus 3 equals 5x minus 9. If I subtract an x from both sides, it will cancel out the x that's on the left-hand side. And of course, on the right-hand side, I'll have 5x minus x, which is 4x. So my equation becomes 3 equals 4x minus 9. Now I want to get that x by itself, and so I need to add 9 to both sides. And when I do, the 9 on the right-hand side will cancel, and the left-hand side will become 3 plus 9, which is 12. So my equation is now 4x equals 12. And if I divide both sides by 4, I'll simply have x equals 12 over 4, or x equals 3. So my solution, or at least what I hope is the solution, is x equals 3. To check that it really is a solution, I'm going to go back to the original problem, or the original equation, and plug in 3. The original equation was square root of x plus 3 equals square root of 5x minus 9. And that means when x is 3, I have square root of 3 plus 3 equals square root of 5 times 3 minus 9. That says that square root of 6 is the square root of 15 minus 9, or square root of 6 equals square root of 6. Does the square root of 6 equal the square root of 6? Yes, it does. And therefore, I'm good to go. 3 really is a solution here. By the way, I don't know what the exact value of square root of 6 is, but here's what I know. I know that the square root of 6, whatever it is, equals the square root of 6, whatever it is, because they're the same thing. So even though I don't know exactly what square root of 6 is, I do know that it equals itself, and therefore I really do have a check that x equals 3 is a solution of the original problem. Now, you might be saying to me, you know, every time we've checked our solutions, everything has worked out. Why do you keep making me do that? Well, Let's do the following example, and hopefully you'll see why it is that I keep worrying about or checking whether I really do have solutions. Here's the example. Let's solve the equation 3x equals 2x plus the square root of 4x plus 5. So the 4x plus 5 is all underneath one square root symbol. In this example, I do need to begin by isolating the radical. Notice that the radical on the right-hand side has another term next to it. That would be the 2x that's added to it. So I need to get rid of that 2x from that side. How do I move that 2x out of the way? I subtract a 2x from both sides of the equation, and the equation will then become 3x minus 2x equals square root of 4x plus 5. Now, 3x minus 2x can actually be simplified, because the 3x and the 2x are like terms, and 3x minus 2x is just 1x. So my equation really is x equals the square root of 4x plus 5. Now, I've isolated the radical. There's just one square root symbol on the right-hand side and nothing else with it. So what do I do next? I square both sides of this equation. And when I do, the left-hand side becomes x squared, because I had to square that side. So I have an x squared on the left. And the right-hand side gives me the square root of 4x plus 5 squared. And when I square that square root, they cancel each other out, if you will, and the right-hand side is just 4x plus 5. So my equation is x squared equals 4x plus 5. Now that's not a linear equation like the first couple of examples we've done today, but it's a quadratic equation, and we know how to solve quadratic equations from our previous lessons as well. So let's solve this equation for x. I have x squared equals 4x plus 5. Do you remember what we do when we solve such a quadratic equation? We want to move all the terms over to one side or the other. In this case, I'm going to move them all over to the left. And by how am I going to do that? I'm going to subtract a 4x from both sides, and I'm going to subtract a 5 from both sides. And when I do, I'll have the equation x squared minus 4x minus 5 equals 0. Now, you have lots of ways to solve this. Quadratic formula, completing the square, there are lots of tools you've seen. But the one that I think is best here is factoring. I think that's a really good choice. So let's factor the left-hand side. In this case, the quadratic, uh, the quadratic polynomial that's on the left factors as 
x minus 5 times x plus 1. And that is set equal to 0 because that's the right-hand side of the equation. x minus 5 times x plus 1 equals 0 is the same as x minus 5 equals 0 or x plus 1 equals 0, which means x is 5 or x equals negative 1. So it looks like we have two solutions here, x equals 5 and x equals negative 1. But as I've been saying, you got to check them. So let's go ahead and go back to the original equation and plug in these two numbers and let's see if indeed both of them are solutions. So we have 3x equals 2x plus the square root of 4x plus 5. Plug in x equals 5 everywhere and you'll have 3 times 5 equals 2 times 5 plus the square root of 4 times 5 plus 5. How does that simplify? Left-hand side is 15. Right-hand side is 10 plus the square root of 20 plus 5. And the right-hand side then is really 10 plus square root of 25. Well, square root of 25 is 5. So what you really have is 15 equals 10 plus 5. That's 15 equals 15. Excellent. X equals 5 really is a solution, so you should keep that. Now let's check that x equals negative 1. Plug in negative 1 to the original equation and you have 3 times negative 1 equals 2 times negative 1 plus the square root of 4 times negative 1 plus 5. And how does that simplify? Well, you're going to have negative 3 equals negative 2 plus the square root of negative 4 plus 5. That's the same at the end of the right-hand side as the square root of 1. Negative 4 plus 5 is 1. Square root of 1 is 1. And that means that what you're really saying is negative 3 equals negative 2 plus 1. Be very careful. Negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. And that means that what you're saying is negative 3 equals negative 1. That is no good. That does not work. Negative 3 does not equal negative 1. And that means that what we plugged in there, x equals negative 1, really isn't a solution. We have a name for one of these sort of imposter solutions. We call them extraneous solutions because they really don't work even though you think they would. And an extraneous solution is not a solution at all. So we're going to throw out x equals negative 1 as a solution and we're only going to keep x equals 5. The original equation only has one solution and that's x equals 5. Now, let's try another example where we have to be very careful about whether we have any solutions, maybe even any solutions at all. Here's the example. I want us to solve 8 plus square root of 4y equals 4. Looks like a perfectly good radical equation. What's the first step? The first step is to isolate the radical. To do that, I'm going to subtract 8 from both sides of the equation to get rid of that 8 at the beginning. And that's going to give me then square root of 4y equals 4 minus 8. I got rid of the 8 on the left by subtracting both sides by 8. And that simplifies a little bit to square root of 4y equals negative 4. Okay, I've isolated the radical. I have the radical symbol on the left all by itself. Now what do we do? Well, we square both sides of this equation and we use the fact that we've been using that we can just square both sides and the square will sort of cancel out the square root. And when I do that, I get 4y on the left equals negative 4 squared on the right. Now, negative 4 squared is negative 4 times negative 4, and that's positive 16. So my equation is now 4y equals 16. I need to get y by itself. Well, to do that, I just divide by 4 on both sides of the equation, and when I do that, I'll have y equals 16 over 4, which is 4. So it looks like y equals 4 is my solution, and we could just move on, but that would be very unwise here. We need to check whether y equals 4 really is a solution. Go back to the original equation. 8 plus square root of 4y equals 4. Plug in 4 for y because we think that's our solution. And we'll have 8 plus square root of 4 times 4 equals 4. And that's the same as 8 plus square root of 16 equals 4. That's 8 plus 4 equals 4 because the square root of 16 is 4. And that says that 12 equals 4. Well, that's no good. 12 doesn't equal 4. What does that mean? It means that this y equals 4 is an extraneous solution. It's not a solution at all. It's an imposter. It's just faking that it's a solution, basically. So we need to throw it out. 
And that means we need to ask the question, what are the solutions then of the original equation? The answer is, there aren't any solutions of that equation. The y equals 4 was the only candidate for a solution, and it was no good. And therefore, we actually don't have any solutions at all in that equation. Okay, I'd like to try another example now, which is a bit more complicated because of what's under the radical symbol. It's not too bad, though. So let's look at the following example. I want us to solve square root of 2x squared plus 8x minus 33 equals x. I want to solve that for the variable x. Now, I've done several examples with you in this lesson. What's the first step? The first step is isolating the radical. It's already done because the left-hand side is just one big radical symbol. So what's the next step? The next step is to square both sides of the equation because that squaring will cancel out the square root on the left-hand side. And when I do that, it's going to leave me just 2x squared plus 8x minus 33 equals the right-hand side squared. Well, that's just x squared. So what I've done is I've converted this radical equation to an equation that just has quadratics in it. And now I can start solving this quadratic equation the way I've done in previous lessons. What's the first step? The first step is to get everything to one side. So I'm going to subtract an x squared from both sides of the equation. That's going to cancel out the x squared that's on the right. And on the left, I'll have 2x squared minus x squared. And that's just plus 1x squared, or just plus x squared. And that means that the left-hand side really is x squared plus 8x minus 33 equals 0. So I now need to go down and look at that equation, x squared plus 8x minus 33 equals 0, and solve for x. Well, the left-hand side's quadratic, so let's try to factor it really quickly. And if I do, I realize that it will factor as x plus 11 times x minus 3 equals 0. Well, that means that x plus 11 equals 0 or x minus 3 equals 0. And that means that either x is negative 11 or x is 3. So we have two possible solutions. Let's check each one separately and see if we really do have any solutions at all. The first thing to do is to go back to the original equation and plug in negative 11. And when I do, I'm going to have square root of 2 times negative 11 squared plus 8 times negative 11 minus 33, and that all equals negative 11. Now, I want to pause for just a second because some of you are probably saying, there's no way I want to do that calculation on the left-hand side. That looks really, really messy. Well, guess what? I'm claiming that we don't have to do it. And what I'm claiming is that negative 11 is actually an extraneous solution, and here's why. Think with me for just a second. On the left-hand side, I have a square root. It's a square root of a big, ugly thing, but it's a square root nevertheless. And a square root is always going to be positive. On the right-hand side of that, I have negative 11. And negative 11, of course, is negative. So here's the question to ask. The left-hand side is the square root of something, which has to be positive. The right-hand side is negative 11, which is negative. Can a positive number ever equal a negative number? Absolutely not. And therefore, that equation is not going to hold. So negative 11 is not a solution, or we call it an extraneous solution, which means it's not a solution. Now, we've checked that negative 11 doesn't work. Let's check that 3 works. I hope it works anyway. Let's try. Go back to the original equation and plug in 3. You'll have square root of 2 times 3 squared plus 8 times 3 minus 33, and that all has to equal 3 because you plugged in 3 for x. Now let's simplify. The left-hand side becomes square root of 18 plus 24 minus 33. That's the same as the square root of 42 minus 33. And that, of course, is the same as the square root of 9, because 42 minus 33 is 9. So your equation is now down to square root of 9 equals 3, or 3 equals 3. Does 3 equal 3? Yes, it does. And that means what we plugged in, x equals 3, really is a solution. And since the negative 11 didn't work, it means that x equals 3 is the only solution to the original equation. And that's great. Now, 
In the time that we have left in our lesson today, I'd like to look at one more example of solving a radical equation. And this example is going to have us combine a couple of ideas, and in particular, we're going to look at some foiling really quickly. So here goes the uh, example. Solve the equation square root of x plus 7 equals square root of x minus 8 plus 3. Now, I've been saying in several examples that the first thing to do is to isolate the radical. Unfortunately, we have two radicals here again, so there's no way to isolate the radical. So just leave that alone for now. The second step we've been taking in our examples is to square both sides. So what I'd like to suggest is that we now square both sides of this equation. When we do, we're going to have square root of x plus 7 squared equals uh, a large term squared. And that large term is going to be square root of x minus 8 plus 3, and we have to square that whole thing. Now, the left-hand side is just a square root being squared. And so that's just going to give me x plus 7 on the left. On the right-hand side, there's a bit of a mess because of the plus 3 there. I can't simply start canceling the square root with the square. What I need to do on the right-hand side instead is to rewrite square root of x minus 8 plus 3 squared as two copies of the th same thing multiplied together, namely square root of x minus 8 plus 3 times another square root of x minus 8 plus 3. Now, why would I do that? Well, it turns out that once things are written that way on the right-hand side, you can FOIL. You might not have thought to do that in a natural way, but you really can FOIL now because you have a binomial times another binomial, two terms times another two terms. So what we're going to do now with this equation is leave the left-hand side alone, it's just x plus 7, and set it equal to whatever we get when we FOIL the right-hand side. So let's now FOIL that right-hand side together. First, the F terms in FOIL are going to be square root of x minus 8 times square root of x minus 8. Then the outside terms will give me 3 times square root of x minus 8. The inside terms also will give me 3 times the square root of x minus 8. And then the L terms will just be 3 times 3, which is 9. Well, guess what? You actually made progress here because the right-hand side now can be simplified as the following. Square root of x minus 8 squared now really is just x minus 8 because you've got a square root being squared. So the right-hand side starts out x minus 8. Then the middle terms on the right-hand side are like terms. 3 square root of x minus 8 plus 3 square root of x minus 8 is 6 square root of x minus 8. That's great. And then you just have a plus 9. That means the right-hand side can be simplified as x plus 1 plus 6 square root of x minus 8. Where did the plus 1 come from? It's coming from the minus 8 plus the 9 that's out on the end. And when you do negative 8 plus 9, you get the 1. So your equation now is x plus 7 equals x plus 1 plus 6 square root of x minus 8. Now you might say, well, what? I didn't accomplish anything at this point. But you did, because the original problem had two square roots in it. Now you only have one square root. You've sort of killed off one of the square roots, if you will, and that's very cool. Now you can start as if this is the start of the problem and isolate the one radical that's there and then work through the problem exactly the way you've worked through the other examples. So let's go back to where we were isolate the radical and work through it. We had x plus 7 equals x plus 1 plus 6 square root of x minus 8. Subtract the x and the 1 over to the left-hand side. Well, guess what? When you subtract those x's, you'll actually get no more x's on either the left or the right-hand side because the x with the x plus 7 and the x with the x plus 1 will cancel each other out. Subtracting the 1 from both sides will give you a 6 on the left because 7 minus 1 is 6. And therefore, this equation simply becomes 6 equals 6 square root of x minus 8. Now you're almost done in terms of the isolation of the radical. Divide both sides by 6 to get rid of the 6 on the right-hand side, and you'll have 1 on the left 
equals square root of x minus 8. You have a 1 on the left because 6 divided by 6 is 1. So now you just know that 1 is the square root of x minus 8. What do you do now? You square both sides. That's what we've been doing all through this lesson. And when you do, you get 1 squared equals just x minus 8. Square root of x minus 8 being squared gives you x minus 8. And so you have 1 equals x minus 8 because 1 squared is 1. Adding 8 to both sides gives you 9 equals x or x equals 9. I could say it either way. And so it looks like I have a solution, x equals 9. Whew, after all that work, I sure hope it really is a solution. Let's check it quickly as we close out our lesson today. Start with the original equation, square root of x plus 7 equals square root of x minus 8 plus 3, and plug in 9 for x. When you do that, the left-hand side becomes square root of 9 plus 7, which is the square root of 16, which is 4. Okay, the left-hand side is 4. The right-hand side becomes square root of 9 minus 8 plus 3, which is the same as square root of 1 plus 3, which is 1 plus 3, because the square root of 1 is 1, and 1 plus 3 is 4. Guess what? 4 does equal 4. So, <laughs> hooray, x equals 9 really is a solution of that pretty complicated equation that we started with. In this lesson, we've talked about solving radical equations, or solving equations that contain radical expressions. We've seen that one of the key features is to isolate that radical term and then to square both sides. And we've also seen that it's very, very important that we always check our solutions to make sure that they're real solutions and not just faking being solutions. In the next lesson, we're going to talk about how to graph functions which contain radicals. I'll see you then.
We're now going to transition to our last couple of lessons for this course and talk about sequences and pattern recognition. In this lesson, I want to define what we mean by the word sequence, and then I want to look at several examples of sequences. Our ultimate goal is to learn to recognize patterns in these sequences and to build formulas for certain types of sequences. In the process, we're going to learn in this lesson about two very special types of sequences, and those are known as geometric sequences and arithmetic sequences. So let's begin with a formal definition of the word sequence. I've now said it several times in the first moments here, but I need to give you a definition of what I really mean. In a minute, I'm going to give you a working definition, but let's start with one that's a little more formal. A sequence is a function whose domain is the set of natural numbers, or the set of positive integers. That's a formal definition for the word sequence. Unfortunately, that definition is extremely hard to work with. It really doesn't give us anything to use in order to help us understand the idea. So let me try to tone it down just a bit with a second definition. We could say that a sequence is an ordered list of objects or in our case, from a more mathematical perspective, a sequence is an ordered list of numbers. Now, that's a bit better in terms of the workability, but it's not exactly the most practical of the definitions. It's better than the first one I gave you, but I'd rather work with something a little more flexible. And so let me share this as our working definition. A sequence of numbers is simply a list, which I'm going to denote as a with a subscript 1, A with a subscript 2, A with a subscript 3, and so on, or said more quickly, A sub 1, A sub 2, A sub 3, and so on. Now, I'm sure you notice those subscripts that I used in my definition, the 1, the 2, the 3. I want you to know that those subscripts are simply acting like labels for me to help me tell which of the numbers is which. In other words, A sub 1 is the first in the list, a sub 2 is the second in the list, A sub 3 is the third in the list, and so on. I should point out that a sequence can actually either be finite so that it ends at some point, or it can be infinite so that it goes on forever. In almost everything that we're going to do in today's lesson, the sequences will be infinite. So, for example, the positive integers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on, they form an infinite sequence. So does the list of even positive integers, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, and so on, as well as the odd positive integers, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, and so on. Each of those is a sequence of numbers. Now, most often I'm going to indicate the fact that a sequence is infinite by attaching a dot, dot, dot to the end of the list of elements. So when you see that dot, 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 it's simply telling you that the list just continues its pattern forever. Now, one other definition is important before we move on to some examples. And that definition is the word term. Each number in our sequence or each number in our list is going to be called a term. So, for example, if we go back to those odd positive numbers, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and so on, the first term is 1, the second term is 3, the third term is 5, and oh, by the way, the sixth term in that sequence would actually be the 11. Now, before we get into the mathematical meat of the lesson, we should really address the question, why do you study sequences? I mean, this really is very different material from what we've seen earlier in the course. So why should we care? Well, there are lots of answers that I could share, but let me just give you a few. First of all, the ability to extend a sequence, that is to find its next term, or to find a formula for every term in the sequence, is an extremely important mathematical skill in general. If I said it more theoretically, I'd want us to be able to sharpen our inductive reasoning skills, and sequences provide an excellent opportunity for that kind of skill building. More to the point, being able to find the pattern for a sequence, or the formula for the nth term of a sequence, is an example of what we call modeling. The skill of being able to determine a function which 
fits the given data is extremely useful. And it's the basis for things such as linear regression in statistics and modeling in general. So let me say it this way. If a person walks up to you and gives you a function, and they give you the rule for the function, they call it f of n, let's say, and they ask you for f of 1, f of 2, and f of 3, so that all you have to do is plug in 1, and plug in 2, and plug in 3, and then see what the output values are, that's really pretty easy most of the time. It's much more real world to expect a person to walk up to you with a list of numbers or a sequence of numbers and then to ask you to find the rule for the function which fits those numbers. That's sort of the opposite problem. They sort of give you the output values and then ask you for the function that gave them those output values. Building that kind of skill is part of the goal for this lesson. One other quick comment on why these sequences are important is this. One of the topics that we study when we study calculus is called infinite series. Now, infinite series are sums of infinitely many numbers. An example would be taking one half plus one fourth plus one eighth plus one sixteenth plus one thirty second plus one sixty fourth and so on, and doing that infinitely far out. It turns out that being able to figure out whether a sum like that exists or doesn't exist is extremely important in calculus. But you can imagine that the first thing you have to do is to find a pattern for each of the terms that you're actually adding up. And finding that kind of a pattern for each of the terms is actually the focus of today's lesson. Now, I just want to make a quick side comment. Just in case you're curious about the sum I just showed you, 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth plus 1 sixteenth and so on, it turns out that that actually does equal the whole number 1. If you keep adding all those fractions that are in that pattern forever, you actually get exactly 1. And by the way, if you take 9 over 10 plus 9 over 100 plus 9 over 1,000 plus 9 over 10,000 and you just keep doing that forever in the same pattern, then you also get 1 as well. And that's just two really cool examples in the study of infinite series. If you'd like to study that kind of thing more, work your way to calculus because those kinds of infinite series show up there all the time. Okay, so let's get started with the topic of this lesson, which is to recognize patterns in some straightforward sequence examples. And I'm going to start, hopefully, with some examples that you can recognize pretty quickly. Here's the first example. Let's find a formula for the nth term in the sequence 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, and so on. And again, what do I mean by the nth term? Well, the 1 here is the first term, and the 3 is the second term, and the 5 is the third term. So what I want is a formula that would tell me any term later on, and it's going to be a function of n. So I want to look for the pattern and write down that formula. Well, I hope you recognize this sequence as the sequence of odd positive numbers. Do you remember a formula that you might have seen in the past for the odd numbers? Some of you might be thinking, well, I think it's something like 2n plus 1 or 2n minus 1. Okay, let's see if either the function f of n equals 2n plus 1 or f of n equals 2n minus 1 works for us. So here's what we would look at. Notice that the first term in our sequence is a 1. That means whatever the rule is for this sequence, when I plug 1 in, I should get 1 back. That's because the first term is supposed to be 1. The second term in the sequence is 3. That means f of 2 is 3. The 2 is coming from the fact that I'm looking at the second term there. So whatever the rule is, it needs to be giving me f of 1 equals 1 and f of 2 equals 3. If I used f of n equals 2n plus 1 as the rule, we would be saying that f of 2 equals 2 times 2 plus 1. Now, 2 times 2 plus 1 is 4 plus 1, which is 5. But wait a minute, we wanted our second term to actually be 3. And that means that the formula can't be f of n equals 2n plus 1. Okay, what about the other candidate we had a moment ago? f of n equals 2n minus 1. Well, let's try plugging in some numbers for n and seeing what we get back. f of 1 in that case is 2 times 1 minus 1 which is 2 minus 1, 
which is 1. Hey, that works because our first term is 1. So that's good. Let's check the second term. f of 2, using 2 as my input value because I'm looking at the second term now, f of 2 is 2 times 2 minus 1, which is 4 minus 1, which is 3. Hey, wait a minute. That's the right term as well. So I could check many of these. It turns out you can check as many as you want, but bottom line, the rule really is f of n equals 2n minus 1. That's the formula for the sequence 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and so on. Now, some of you might be saying, I didn't know that the pattern was going to be something like 2n minus 1 or 2n plus 1. How in the world was I supposed to do that? Well, don't worry about it. I'm actually going to talk us through more of this in this lesson and in the next lesson so that you can actually build these rules from scratch without having to do any guessing as to what the rule is like we just did in that example. Okay, let's look at another example real quickly. Give a formula for the nth term in the sequence 1, 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, 1 fifth, and so on. Now, if you just look at those numbers for a moment, you'll see that a lot of them look like they're following the same pattern. You kind of see how the 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, 1 fifth is going? I would say that most of us would say the only potential problem is the 1 that's sort of sticking out in front. It doesn't look like a fraction. It's not really following the pattern very well. Ah, but I can rewrite that 1 as simply 1 over 1, right? 1 is 1 over 1. And so I'm going to say that my sequence is the same as 1 over 1, 1 over 2, 1 over 3, 1 over 4, 1 over 5, and so on. And from here, I hope you see that the pattern is just 1 over n if you want the nth term. If you wanted the seventh term, it would be 1 over 7. If you wanted the 20th term, it would be 1 over 20. And if you want the nth term, it would be 1 over n. Okay. That was a nice example. Let's go to another example where we're trying to see what that formula for the nth term looks like. So here's the example. Give a formula for the nth term in the sequence 3, 9, 27, 81, 243, and so on. Now, when a pattern is not immediately obvious to you in one of these sequences, one question you might want to ask yourself is, how do we get from one term to the next term in the sequence? Just kind of focus on whether you can see what to do to get from one term to the next. And in this case, I hope you see, after you think about it for a moment, that what you want to do is multiply each term by 3 to get up to the next one. In other words, 9 is equal to 3 times 3, and 27 is equal to 9 times 3, and 81 is 27 times 3, and 243 actually is 81 times 3. And this gives us a hint that a formula for the nth term of this sequence is going to be related to a power of 3 because we keep multiplying by 3's every time to find the terms. So let's, let me suggest that we try f of n equals 3 to the nth power as our formula for the nth term. If it doesn't work, fine, but we can at least try it to see if it works. So here we go. If f of n equals 3 to the n, then f of 1 would be 3 to the 1, which would be 3. Now here's a question. Is the first term equal to 3? Yes. So f of 1 equaling 3 is great for us. Let's try the next term. f of 2 in the formula would be 3 raised to the second power, 3 to the 2. 3 to the 2 is 9. Is the second term 9 in the sequence? Yes, and that means we're good to go still. Let's try one more just to see if we get it right. f of 3, that would be the third term, is equal to 3 to the third power, 3 to the 3, and 3 to the 3 is equal to 27 because it's 3 times 3 times 3. 27 is the third term in our sequence. That checks as well. You can check a number of the terms if you want, but I'm telling you right now that the formula for the nth term here really is 3 to the n, and so we're good to go there as well. Now, I want to try another example that kind of has that same flavor, but it's going to be a little bit different. So let's see what happens. Give a formula for the nth term in 2, 10, 50, 250, 1,250, and so on. Now, again, if the pattern is not immediately obvious, a question you want to ask is, can I tell how to just get from one term to the next? 
And does that keep happening? In this case, it looks like we're going to multiply again by the same amount. This time, you're going to multiply by 5, right? Because to get from 2 to 10, you multiply 2 times 5. 2 times 5 is 10. And then if you take the 10 and multiply by 5, you get 50, which is the next term. And 50 times 5 is 250, which is the next term. And 250 times 5 is 1,250. So it gives me a hint that a formula for the nth term is probably going to be related to a power of 5. But the formula can't just be f of n equals 5 raised to the n, because in that case, f of 1 would be 5 to the 1, which is 5. But my first term is equal to 2 if you look at my sequence. So that really fouls things up. What are we going to do? Well, here's what you're going to do. That 5 to the n really ought to be there because we keep multiplying by 5. So why don't we try the formula f of n equals 2 times 5 to the n. Then we'll have the 2 thrown in. Let's try it. f of 1, if the formula f of n is 2 times 5 to the n, f of 1 would be 2 times 5 to the 1. And that's 2 times 5, which is 10. But that's not right because I want my first term to be 2. But wait a minute, I want you to notice something. Go back to the sequence. You actually see that 10 is the second term in the sequence. So it would be f of 2, not f of 1. And that's a hint, actually, that you and I are closer than you might think right now to our formula. Instead of f of n being 2 times 5 to the n, we need to try to back the formula up a little bit so that instead of getting 10 as our first term, we get 2 as our first term. Well, guess what we need to do then? We need to rewrite the formula as 2 times 5 to the n minus 1. Not 2 times 5 to the n, but 2 times 5 to the n minus 1. And when we do, instead of landing on 10 as our first term, I hope it'll take us back to the beginning of the sequence. Let's try it. Let's use f of n equals 2 times 5 to the n minus 1. A little bit complicated, but we can handle it. And now let's plug in 1. By plugging in 1, we're going to try to get our first term. f of 1 is 2 times 5 to the 1 minus 1. That's 2 times 5 to the 0, and 5 to the 0 is just 1. So I have 2 times 1, which is 2. And guess what? That's the right first term. Let's try the second term then. To check my second term, I'm going to plug 2 into my formula. I'm going to look at f of 2, which is 2 times 5 raised to the 2 minus 1. And what is that? That's 2 times 5 to the 1. That's 2 times 5, and that's 10. Guess what? 10 was my second term. I'm really on the right track. Let's check the third term to see if I get the right number back. f of 3 is 2 times 5 to the 3 minus 1. I'm just plugging in 3 for n. And that would be the same as 2 times 5 to the 2. That's 2 times 25, and that's 50. And guess what, folks? We just found it. We just checked the first three values. Now, that's not a perfect proof, but by checking the first three and landing on the right values every time, I'm saying, good to go. f of n equals 2 times 5 to the n minus 1 really is the formula that we want. Now, one bit of terminology before we move forward. Did you notice that the previous two examples both had the same kind of idea, which was, if you wanted to go from one term to the next, you multiplied by the same number every time. In one case, we were multiplying by 3. In the other case, we were multiplying by 5 to get from one term to the next every time. When you're doing that sort of thing, it turns out the sequence has a special name. It's called a geometric sequence. Geometric sequence. And so you just saw two examples of geometric sequences there. I'd like to look at one more such example before we move forward. Here's the example. Find a formula for the nth term of the sequence 2, negative 4, 8, negative 16, 32, negative 64, and so on. Now, if I ignore the alternating signs, the plus and the minus and the plus and the minus, I'm just going to have 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and so on. I hope you recognize that those are powers of 2. 2 is 2 to the 1, 4 is 2 to the 2, 8 is 2 to the 3, and so on. So our formula for the nth term has got to be related to the formula 2 to the nth power. But how do you get the negative signs to come in? Well, 
What if instead of multiplying each term by 2, we multiplied by negative 2? Then here's what we'd have. If you multiply the 2 by a negative 2, you get negative 4. If you multiply the negative 4 by negative 2, you get positive 8. And if you multiply 8 by negative 2, you get negative 16, and so on. And that means that our formula isn't related to 2 to the n, it's actually related to negative 2 to the nth power. And by putting in that negative, we can hopefully get the alternating signs back in the terms of the sequence. So let's try f of n equals negative 2 raised to the nth power, and let's see if that actually gives us what we want. Plugging in 1 for n, we would have negative 2 to the 1, which is negative 2. Oh, that's not right exactly, because we wanted positive 2. But let's, let's just try a couple more input values just to see what we're getting. If you plug in 2 into the formula, you get negative 2 squared, which is negative 2 times negative 2, which is 4. And if you plug in 3 for n, you'll get negative 2 cubed, which is negative 8. I want you to notice something. Every one of these signs is completely wrong. Whenever I wanted a positive, I got a negative, and whenever I wanted a negative, I got a positive. How would I handle cleaning up those signs? Well, the answer is to multiply the whole rule by a negative 1. And if you do that for every one of the terms, that is, have the rule be negative times negative 2 to the n, I think we'll get the right signs. Let's try it. Let's let f of n equal the negative of negative 2 to the nth power. It looks complicated, but we can, we can get through the arithmetic. Plug in 1 to check the first term, and you'll have negative times the negative 2 raised to the first power. Now, negative 2 raised to the first power is negative 2. So what you have is negative, negative 2, and that's positive 2. And guess what? That's our first term. It was positive 2. We're on the right track. Let's now plug in a 2 for n to check the second term. I'm going to have the negative of negative 2 squared. Remember, I do the exponentiation first, order of operations. Negative 2 squared is a positive 4, but there's a negative out in front of it to give me negative 4. And that's the right term that we want there as well. And lastly, the third term, plug in a 3. f of 3 is the negative of negative 2 raised to the third power. Now, negative 2 to the third by itself is negative 8. With the extra negative out in front, you'll have negative, negative 8, which is positive 8. And guess what? The first three terms now work, and we've now found our formula. f of n equals the negative of negative 2 to the n. Now, there's nothing special about just checking three terms. If you really wanted to be careful, you'd check a whole bunch more. But our time together doesn't permit us to check many more than that. If you want to try a few others, go ahead until you convince yourself that we really have the right rule. Now, let me make one last comment on geometric series, and then I really want to move on to uh, arithmetic sequences. Notice that in the previous three examples on geometric sequences, the final formula for the nth term had an exponential function. Some number was being raised to the nth power. That will always be the case with a geometric sequence. You always want to end up with at least part of it being a number raised to the nth power. Now, let's move to a different type of sequence as we close out our lesson today, and that sequence is going to be called an arithmetic sequence. I want to point out that the word looks like arithmetic, and we sometimes pronounce it that way, but the same spelling also can be pronounced arithmetic if you uh, emphasize a different syllable. And this is what we call an arithmetic sequence. It's a sequence which is built one term at a time, but not by multiplying like we did before, but by adding the same number each time, one term at a time. Believe it or not, you've already seen examples of arithmetic sequences today. Think about it. The sequence of even numbers, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, and so on. That's an arithmetic sequence. How do you get from 2 to 4, and then 4 to 6, and then 6 to 8, and 8 to 10, and 10 to 12, and so on? You add the same number every time, 2. 2 plus 2 is 4. 4 plus 2 is 6, 6 plus 2 is 8, and so on. So the even positive integers are an example of an arithmetic sequence. The sequence of odd numbers is also arithmetic, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and so on, because there again, all you're doing is adding the same amount to every term to get to the next term. 
And remember, we had a formula for the odd positive integers earlier, and that was f of n was equal to 2n minus 1. Now, quick bit of terminology. In that arithmetic sequence where you're adding the same amount each time to get from one term to the next, the amount that you add each time actually has a name. It's called the common difference. It's common because it's happening every time, and it's actually a difference because if you think about it, it's the amount you get when you subtract one term from the next. So I want to look now at arithmetic sequences and try to find a formula for the nth term of such an arithmetic sequence. So here's the example we'll start with. Look at the sequence 2, 5, 8, 11, 14, 17, 20, 23, and so on. Now, first thing I want you to notice is that this is not a geometric sequence because you're not multiplying by the same amount to get from one term to the next. But what you are doing is adding the same amount to get from one term to the next. Look at it. Go from 2 to 5, you need to add 3. To go from 5 to 8, you need to add 3. To go from 8 to 11, you just add 3, and so on. So this thing is definitely an arithmetic sequence, and the common difference here is the number 3. Now, if you start to look at the terms just for a second and you want to start building this formula, here's what I'm going to suggest we look at. Notice the following. Now, you might not have written it this way the first time, but I'm just trying to show you where the pattern is hiding. First of all, I can rewrite 2 as 2 plus 0 times 3. I know it looks weird, but just stay with me as we write this down together. The next number, 5, is actually the same as 2 plus 1 times 3. Again, if you did your order of operations, the 1 times 3 would be done first, and you just have 3 there, and then you'd have 2 plus 3, which equals 5. The 8 is the same as 2 plus 2 times 3. Because 2 times 3 is 6, when you add 2, you get 8. So are you seeing a pattern here? 2 plus 0 times 3, 2 plus 1 times 3, 2 plus 2 times 3. Look at the 11. It's the same as 2 plus 3 times 3, and the 14 is the same as 2 plus 4 times 3. And this leads us to a very nice formula for the arithmetic sequence here. It is f of n equals 2 plus, did you notice how every one of those things had a 2 plus in it? And then I'm going to have n minus 1 times 3. Did you notice how everything had a times 3 in it as well when I was writing them down? So the only problem was to figure out what was going to go in front of the times 3. And it turns out that it's actually just n minus 1. So I'm going to rewrite that formula in a slightly different way as f of n equals 3 times n minus 1 plus 2. All I've done is rewrite some things, but it's perfectly legal what I've written there. Notice that the 2 was the first term in the sequence, and the 3 was the common difference. Now, first thing you ought to ask is, is that kind of formula going to happen for every arithmetic sequence that you give me? Well, let's try another example, and let's check. Find a formula for the nth term of this sequence. 5, 12, 19, 26, 33, and so on. Notice that this really is an arithmetic sequence. The first number or the first term in the sequence is 5. And what's the common difference? Can you tell how much you need to add to get from one term to the next every time? The common difference here is 7. Because 5 plus 7 is 12, 12 plus 7 is 19, and so on. If the formula in this example is going to look like the formula in the earlier example, then it needs to be f of n equals 7 times n minus 1 plus 5. 7 was the common difference, 5 was the first term. I say we check to see if that really is the right formula. So how do we check? Well, the first term needs to be f of 1, because it's the first term. So I plug 1 into that formula for n, and I have 7 times 1 minus 1 plus 5. Well, 1 minus 1 is 0. 7 times 0 is 0. Plus 5 gives me 5. And that's right, because the first term was 5. So we're good to go there. Let's check the second term. Plug in 2 to the formula. Plug in 2 for n. And you'll have 7 times 2 minus 1 plus 5. Order of operations tells me I've got to do everything in parentheses first. 2 minus 1 is 1. Then I have to do the multiplication next. 7 times that 1 
is 7, and then I add the 5, and I get 12. And if you check, 12 was the second term in the sequence. Let's do one more. Plug in 3 for n, and you'll have 7 times 3 minus 1 plus 5, which is 7 times 2 plus 5, which is 14 plus 5, which is 19. And folks, that's the third term in the sequence. That's what you wanted because you plugged in 3, and therefore this formula really works very, very well. Now, in this lesson today, we've talked about sequences, lots of different types of sequences. We've talked about definitions like what a sequence is, what a term is, and special types of sequences like arithmetic and geometric sequences. I should point out that there are lots of other kinds of sequences out there. I've only shown you really a couple types today. The, one of the most famous is called the Fibonacci sequence, which isn't geometric and it isn't arithmetic either. I'm hoping that in the next lesson we can mention it, though, very, very quickly. But in today's lesson, we've talked about sequences, we've talked about these special families, geometric sequences and arithmetic sequences, and I've tried to show you some formulas for both of these types of sequences. And in the process, we've developed some inductive reasoning skills as we've looked for these patterns and tried to build these formulas based on those patterns. In our next lesson, I want to use the idea of this common difference as a springboard for a number of different types of sequences that I couldn't show you today. That's going to lead us, believe it or not, to solving systems of linear equations that we studied in one of our earlier lessons in this course. I look forward to talking about that with you then. In our previous lesson, we started talking about sequences, what they are, how to recognize patterns in them, and special types of sequences called geometric sequences and arithmetic sequences. We saw how to write down a rule for any geometric sequence and a rule for any arithmetic sequence as well. In this lesson, I want to continue talking about sequences and finding patterns in them. And I want to focus our attention on ways to actually build the formula for certain types of sequences, even if it's not clear what the pattern might be when we first look at the terms in the sequence. The recipe that I'm going to show you only works for certain types of sequences, but it is still a very useful and valuable tool. By the end of the lesson, you'll see a really nice use of systems of linear equations, which we talked about several lessons ago. In fact, it might be wise for you to pause at this point and review our lessons on solving systems of linear equations and then come back to this lesson. That's how important systems of linear equations will be as we go through today's lesson. So let's get started by reminding ourselves of a few facts we learned in the previous lesson. First, a sequence is simply a list of numbers that I will often write as a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, and so on. Remember, those numbers, 1, 2, and 3, and so on, are simply subscripts which are acting like labels to remind me that I have a first number and a second number and a third number in the list, and so on. And remember, each of those numbers is called a term. A sequence which is built term by term by adding the same number each time is called an arithmetic sequence. So, for example, the sequence 2, 5, 8, 11, 14, 17, and so on, is an arithmetic sequence. In the previous lesson, we built a formula for this sequence, and we wrote it down as f of n equals 3 times n minus 1 plus 2. Remember, the 2 comes from being the first term in the sequence, and the 3 is the common difference, which is the amount we added to each term to get to the next term. So, for example, we had f of 1, which would give us our first term, equaling 3 times 1 minus 1 plus 2, which is 3 times 0 plus 2, which is 2. And that really is the first term in that sequence. Then the second term would be found from f of 2, and that would be 3 times 2 minus 1 plus 2, which is 3 times 1 plus 2, which is 3 plus 2, which is 5. And that really is the second term in the sequence. 
Let's check one more. F of three would be the third term. And if we plug in three for n, we would have three times three minus one plus two, which is three times two plus two, which is six plus two, which is eight. And that's the third term in that sequence. Now, for the rest of this lesson, I wanna talk about common differences, but I wanna talk about them in a slightly different way by calling them first differences of a sequence. And here's what I mean by that. Let's go back to that sequence 2, 5, 8, 11, 14, and so on that I was just talking about a few moments ago. I now want to look at the differences between the terms. So what I mean by that is, for example, I want to look at 5 minus 2, and of course that's equal to 3. And then 8 minus 5 is 3. And 11 minus 8 is 3. 14 minus 11 is 3. And 17 minus 14 is also 3. Notice that all of those differences are the same. I just said three a whole bunch of times. But of course they're the same because they are the common difference that we talked about in the previous lesson. So when these first differences are always the same, it means that you have an arithmetic sequence. And the formula for that nth term is going to be a linear formula. What do I mean by that? Well, if you look at the formula that we came up with in the example I just gave you, it had a variable n in it, and that degree of that polynomial was one, because the formula was three times n minus one plus two. And the highest power of n that you see there is the n raised to the first power that's inside the parentheses, n to the one minus one. So what we had there was really a linear function or a linear polynomial, degree one. But this leads us actually to a very cool question which I wanna talk about for today's lesson. What if the first differences are not the same, but somehow later differences are the same? Let me show you what I mean with the following example. I want us to find a formula for the nth term of this sequence, 3, 6, 11, 18, 27, 38, 51, 66, and so on. I wanna give you lots of terms here because we're gonna be doing a lot of calculations between the terms, and so I wanna make sure that the pattern is clear as we go looking at this sequence. Now, this sequence is not like any of the ones that we've seen before. It's certainly not a geometric sequence, and why is it not a geometric sequence? Well, think about it. To be geometric, you have to be able to multiply by the same number to get from each term to every other term. And that means, in this example, to get from three to six, you'd have to multiply by two. If this sequence is geometric, it means that to get from six to 11, you'd have to multiply by two as well. But six times two is 12, not 11. So this sequence is not geometric. Interestingly enough, it's also not an arithmetic sequence. Again, let's look at it. If you look at the difference between six and three, that's three but the difference between 11 and six is five. 11 minus six is five. Well, you don't have a common difference then, because remember, to have an arithmetic sequence, you have to be able to add by the same amount from term to term every time you go from one term to the next. And in this case, to go from three to six, you have to add by three, but to go from six to 11, you would have to add five. So this thing is not arithmetic either. So what do you do? Do you just quit? Well, no. Let's do the following. Come down and look at all of the common differences between the numbers as we look at them one term at a time. If you look at the difference between the six and the three, you'll see that it's a three, fine. The difference between the 11 and the six is a five. Okay, let's build them all. The difference between 18 and 11 is seven. 18 minus 11 is seven. The difference between 27 and 18 is nine. From 38 down to 27 is 11, if you do 38 minus 27. 51 minus 38 is 13, and 66 minus 51 is 15. Okay, now those numbers are all different. Three, five, seven, nine, 11, 13, 15. That didn't help us at all. At least it doesn't look like it helped us. But here's what I want you to do. Let's go one step further. Let's now take the 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, and let's look at the differences 
between those numbers for just a moment. Okay, 5 minus the 3 is a 2. Fair enough. 7 minus 5 is also a 2. That's interesting. And then 9 minus 7 is 2 as well. In fact, 11 minus 9 is 2, 13 minus 11 is 2, and 15 minus 13 is also 2. What do we see? We see that the what are called the second differences are the same. What are the second differences? Well, we started with our sequence. We took a set of differences to get the 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15. That set of numbers is called the first differences. And then we took differences of those. We subtracted those from one another. And that new set, which was just 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, those are called the second differences. Now, the second differences here were all the same. What does that tell us about the formula for the terms in the sequence that we have? Well, here's what it tells us. It turns out that the formula for the nth term in this sequence is a degree two polynomial where the variable is going to be n here. It's going to be a quadratic polynomial. Why? Because by having to do two sets of differences to get the same answer every time, our polynomial formula will have to have degree two. It's not because all the numbers there were two, it's because I had to do two layers of differences in order to get the same number. That's how I know that the polynomial formula will have to have degree two. Now that is a huge hint, and here's why. It means that my formula for the terms must have a quadratic term in it, an n squared in it, and maybe it'll have an n in it, and it might have a constant in it. In other words, the formula is going to look like f of n equals a n squared plus b n plus c, where a, b, and c are just some numbers. Okay, well, how do we figure out a, b, and c? I mean, I haven't really told you a whole lot, have I? Well, in fact, I have, because now that you know that the formula looks like that, we can use our knowledge of solving systems of linear equations in order to find a, b, and c. And that's why I warned you that you might want to review solving systems of linear equations as we go into this lesson. Now, here's how we're going to use solving systems of linear equations to figure out this problem. First of all, I know that f of 1 is 3. In other words, the first term in the sequence that we started with is 3. So f of 1 is 3. But if I go to that formula, f of n equals a n squared plus b n plus c, and I plug 1 into that, I'll know that f of 1 equals a times 1 squared plus b times 1 plus c. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, I know that f of 1 equals 3, and I know that f of 1 equals a times 1 squared plus b times 1 plus c. That means the 3 has to equal a times 1 squared plus b times 1 plus c because they're both equal to f of 1. And if I simplify that a times 1 squared plus b times 1 plus c, I'm really just going to get a plus b plus c. And that gives me an equation. I now know that a plus b plus c must equal 3. I have no clue what a, b, and c are yet. They're just those coefficients in the formula. But I know that their sum, a plus b plus c, must equal 3. Now let's keep that equation off to the side for just a second. And let's now see if we can build a second equation. We now also know that f of 2, the second term, has to equal 6. Go back and look at the sequence we started with. The second term equals 6. So f of 2 is 6. But f of 2 in the formula is also equal to a times 2 squared plus b times 2 plus c, because I'm plugging in 2 for n. Now what is a times 2 squared plus b times 2 plus c? Well, it's exactly the same as 4a plus 2b plus c. The 4 in the 4a comes from 2 squared. Well, f of 2 is 6 but f of 2 is also 4a plus 2b plus c. And that means that 6 equals 4a plus 2b plus c. Guess what? You just build another equation that involves the a, the b, and the c. Let's put that equation to the side now. We now have two equations with a's, b's, and c's. If we could find a third one 
we actually can start working on getting A, B, and C, and we're constructing them from scratch. So let's get a third equation now. Let's plug in three to the formula. What would have to happen? Well, first of all, the third term in the sequence is 11. So f of three is 11. That's one thing we know. But f of three, if I go back to the formula, is equal to a times three squared plus b times three plus c. And if you simplify that pretty quickly, you're gonna get 9a plus 3b plus c equals 11. And so f of three equals 9a plus 3b plus c, and f of three equals 11, and so I can build that third equation. 9a plus 3b plus c equals 11. Now, I've got three equations in hand, and I have three unknowns. And now the question is, how do I solve this kind of a system? Notice that I have three equations and three unknowns. In most of what we did in our earlier lessons on solving systems of linear equations, we only had two equations with two unknowns. But it's not a problem. We're gonna just have to do a little bit more work in order to finish this, but we really can do it. So stay with me as we now solve this system of linear equations. Okay, subtracting the first equation from the second gives me a new equation. 3a plus b equals three. Notice that we've accomplished something very important. I've eliminated the variable c. If that may remind you, I hope, of when we solved systems of linear equations by elimination. Now I know that 3a plus b equals three or that b equals negative 3a plus three by subtracting that 3a over to the other side. But I could have also subtracted the second equation from the third equation in the original system of equations. And by doing that subtraction, second equation from the third equation, I would have had 5a plus b equals five. And again, I have eliminated that c. And now I really have two equations with just the unknowns a and b. And that goes back to our previous lessons. I can now substitute negative 3a plus three in for b in this second new equation. So I had 5a plus b equals five, and now I'm gonna replace b by negative 3a plus three. What does that give me? It gives me 5a plus negative 3a plus three equals five, or 5a minus 3a plus three equals five. Let's simplify a bit. 5a minus 3a, that's 2a. Then I have 2a plus three equals five. Subtract three from both sides of that equation and you'll have 2a equals two because five minus three is two. Dividing both sides by two gives me a equals one. And now you've found, you actually constructed by yourself a, the first coefficient in this formula. A was the coefficient in front of the n squared term in the formula, f of n equals a n squared plus b n plus c. You now know that that coefficient in front of the n squared term is one because a equals one. But if a equals one and b equals negative three a plus three, then I can actually find b by plugging in one for a in that equation. I have b equals negative three a plus three. Plugging in one for a gives me b equals negative three times one plus three, or b equals negative three plus three, that means b equals zero. Guess what? You now have two of your coefficients because you now know not only that a is one, but that b equals zero. And by the way, that means your formula is f of n equals one times n squared plus zero times n plus c, which I can just write as f of n equals n squared plus c. Now, remember what we're doing. We're trying to find the formula for the terms in that sequence we started with. So we're almost there. We just need to calculate c. We'll go back to any of the three equations we started with. How about a plus b plus c equals three and plug in a equals one and b equals zero. And at that point, you'll have one plus zero plus c equals three or one plus c equals three, which means c equals two. You now have the full formula in front of you for these terms. F of n is going to equal one n squared plus zero n plus two, because c was two, 
and that simplifies to f of n equals n squared plus 2. Now, I would suggest that we actually check that that formula is exactly what we get for these terms. So let's do that with the first few terms in the sequence, just to make sure it checks out. If you plug 1 into the function f of n, you'll have 1 squared plus 2, which is 1 plus 2, which is 3. That was the first term. What about the second term? Well, plug in 2 to the formula, and you'll have 2 squared plus 2, which is 4 plus 2, which is 6. And that gives us confidence that we're on the right track. Plug in 3 to check for the third term, and you'll have 3 squared plus 2, which is 9 plus 2, which is 11. Great. Plug in 4. Why not? 4 squared plus 2, which is 16 plus 2, which is 18. And that was the fourth term in the sequence. Let's check one more. Plug in 5 to look for the fifth term, and you'll get 5 squared plus 2, which is 25 plus 2, which is 27. And we have the right formula. So you might say, ah, who cares? What's so great about that? Well, the thing that's great about it is, I would have never been able to guess that formula, but you and I actually built it from scratch from using one basic principle. And that principle was, if you have a sequence whose second differences are all the same, then a formula for the nth term is going to be a degree 2 or quadratic polynomial. In fact, if you have a sequence that needs you to take three differences, three sets of differences, in order to get the same differences, then a formula for the nth term is going to be a cubic or degree 3 polynomial. And in fact, if you have a sequence that needs you to take four sets of differences in order to get all the same differences, then the formula for the nth term is going to be a degree 4 polynomial, and so on and so on. The formulas for each of these can be found by solving a system of linear equations. Now, it might be a big system of linear equations, but in fact, that's all you're really going to need. Now, let's look at another example of this pretty quickly. I want us to determine just the degree of the formula for the nth term of this sequence. 2, 18, 52, 110, 198, 322, and so on. I just want to know the degree of the formula, the degree of the polynomial that I'll need for describing the terms in this sequence. Well, first off, it's definitely not geometric. I just want you to notice this is not a geometric sequence. Remember what a geometric sequence would need. You'd have to be able to multiply the 2 by the one number to get up to 18. Of course, you'd have to multiply by 9 then to get up to 18, because 2 times 9 is 18. But to be geometric then, I would have to take the 18 times the 9 to get up to the next number. Well, 18 times 9 is much bigger than 52. So it's definitely not geometric. Well, is it arithmetic? Maybe it is. Let's check what we would have to add term by term to have an arithmetic sequence. To get from 2 to 18, I would add 16. Well, if I add 16 to 18, I'm only going to get 34. I don't get 52. And therefore, this is also not an arithmetic sequence. So I'm suggesting that the next thing we do is start taking some differences and do it level by level and see if we ever get to the point where the differences all become the same. So start with your sequence. 218, 52, 110, 198, 322, and so on. And let's take the first set of differences. 18 minus 2 is 16. 52 minus 18, 34. 110 minus 52 is 58. I know these are kind of big, but just do them by longhand and you'll be fine. 198 minus 110 is 88. And 322 minus 198 is 124. Now, those are definitely very different differences. So we have to keep trying. Let's go to the next level and take differences now of what we just found and see what we get. 34 minus 16 is 18. 58 minus 34 is 24. Ah, uh, that's kind of a bummer. I was hoping we get the same number, but that's okay. Let's keep calculating along this level and just see what we get. 88 minus 58, that's 30. 124 minus 88 is 36. Okay, I got 18, 24, 30, 36. Let's just try one more level and see what happens. 24 minus 18 is 6. 30 minus 24 is also 6. And 36 minus 30 
is six again. And it turns out if you do a whole bunch of these, you'll find that at this third level of differences, you have found the same difference. Six followed by six and six and six and six and so on. And that means that our hint is a formula for the polynomial, which is going to give me the terms in the sequence, is going to have degree three because we had to do three sets of differences before we found that they were all the same difference. Now, as a side note, let me make a few comments about the example that we just finished, about the degree being three. Since the formula for the terms really will be a polynomial of degree three, it means that the formula is going to look like this. f of n equals a n cubed, because it's degree three, plus b n squared, plus c n, plus d, where the a, the b, the c, and the d are all some numbers that I don't know yet. So it turns out that I would have four unknown quantities, a, b, c, and d, and if I wanted to solve for those, I would have to write down four equations. You always need the same number of equations as the unknowns. Now, building four equations here can be done. It's a little bit laborious, but it can be done. And it turns out if you use the first four values of the sequence we started with, the equations would be a plus b plus c plus d equals 2, 8a plus 4b plus 2c plus d equals 18, 27a plus 9b plus 3c plus d equals 52, and 64a plus 16b plus 4c plus d equals 110. Notice that the right-hand sides of those equations are exactly the first four terms of the sequence, 2, 18, 52, 110. Now, that is not a friendly looking system of equations. I'll actually give you that. But it turns out that this system can be solved for A, B, C, and D, just like we solved the previous system in the other example. Now, I wouldn't ask you to solve that large a system in this course, but you could do it. If you were just going through it long enough, you could solve that system. You have the tools to do it. And it turns out that the solution is actually really, really clean, believe it or not. If you solve that system, you'll find out that a equals 1, b equals 3, c equals 0, and d equals negative 2. Those are all pretty nice coefficients. And that means that the formula is f of n equals 1n cubed plus 3n squared plus 0n, because c is 0, minus 2. Or just n cubed plus 3n squared minus 2. Now, Given that I've told you that formula, I'd actually like to check to see if that works. I mean, I'd just be curious to know if we've got the right formula here. Let's plug in 1 and see if we got the first term back. If you plug in 1, you'll have 1 cubed plus 3 times 1 squared minus 2. And that's the same as 1 plus 3 minus 2, or 4 minus 2, which is 2. Was the first term 2? Yes, it was. Perfect. Let's now plug 2 into the formula and see if we get the second term back. We'll have 2 raised to the third power plus 3 times 2 squared minus 2. And that's equal to 8 plus 3 times 4, which is 12, minus 2. 8 plus 12 minus 2 is 20 minus 2, which is 18. That was the second term. Excellent. Let's plug in a 3 to see if we get the third term back. Get 3 raised to the third power plus 3 times 3 squared minus 2. And that's the same as 27 plus 3 times 9, which is another 27, minus 2. 27 plus 27 is 54. Minus 2 gives you 52. And that checks. Now, just for fun, let's check to see if we can get the sixth term correct. Why not? Let's just jump to over to the sixth term. That means I'm going to plug a 6 in to my formula. And what do I get? I'm going to have 6 raised to the third plus 3 times 6 squared minus 2. 6 to the third is a 6 times another 6 times another 6, and that's 216. Then the middle term is going to be 3 times 6 squared, or 3 times 36. That's 108. And then I'm going to subtract 2. So I have 216 plus 108 minus 2. Well, 216 plus 108 is 324 minus another 2 on the end is 322. Was the sixth term 322? Yes, it was. So it checks. This formula really works. And again, it would be impossible to guess that as the formula. But by using these systems of linear equations,
we can actually construct that formula, which I think is really, really cool. Now, I can imagine that you're thinking a couple different thoughts. First of all, that's really gross. I mean, it looked really messy, and I don't want to think about solving those really big systems of linear equations. But again, the beauty of this is that we didn't have to be creative. We could just do the work and apply the recipe to find the formula. Sometimes in math, you don't have to be pretty about it or elegant about it, just effective and, and efficient. And in fact, this really did work. So, okay, we weren't creative, but we got the formula, and that was the goal. And I think that's an important thing to know. You might also be thinking that all of the interesting sequences out there must be like the ones that I've shown you over the last two lessons, where the differences between terms become constant or something along those lines. Well, that would be a bad assumption. And I want to show you a very well-known sequence which defies all of what we've seen so far. Look at this sequence. 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, and so on. Now, maybe it works just like all the others have in this lesson, so let's try building those first differences. 1 minus 1 is 0. 2 minus 1 is 1. 3 minus 2 is 1. 5 minus 3 is 2. 8 minus 5 is 3. 13 minus 8 is 5. And 21 minus 13 is 8. Okay, those are definitely not common, so they're not the same, I mean, and therefore, I don't have a degree 1 formula. But let's try the second level. Let's just take the differences of what I just calculated, and if you do, you'll notice that starting with the 1 and the 1 again, 1 minus 1 will be 0 again, 2 minus 1 will be 1, 3 minus 2 will be 1, 5 minus 3 is 2, and 8 minus 5 is 3. So again, I didn't get the same differences. Might I point out to you what's really happening? What's really happening is that the differences are exactly the original sequence. They're just repeating over and over. So as you keep taking differences at level after level after level, you're just going to get the same sequence back. And therefore, this sequence defies this sort of idea of building the formula the way I did earlier in this lesson. Turns out this sequence is several centuries old, and it has a name. It's called the Fibonacci sequence, and it's been around since at least the 13th century AD. It's a really cool sequence, but it doesn't fit into the mold of the other kinds of sequences we've looked at today. In fact, its formula, if you think about how those terms were working, its formula is really interesting. 1 plus 1 is 2, and then the 1 plus 2 is 3, and then the 2 plus 3 is 5, and 3 plus 5 is 8, and so on. So the terms are being built by adding a pair to get the next one, and then adding a pair to get the next. So for example, 21 plus 34 is actually the next term up, 55. And the formula you're using to build those terms is actually known as a linear recurrence. It's possible to find a formula for a linear recurrence, but the mathematical tools that we need are beyond this course to do that. So we won't worry about that formula today. Well, I hope you've seen in this lesson that the subject of sequences is a really rich one, a very enjoyable one. We've learned today about more pattern recognition and also how to build patterns or formulas for the nth term of a sequence, basically from scratch in some cases. In the process, we've developed our inductive reasoning skills some more, and we've seen some nifty uses for things like systems of linear equations. And now we've come to the end of our course, and I'm so thankful that you worked with me on this Algebra 1 material, and I wish you the very best as you continue in your mathematical journey. Algebra 1 is one of the most critical courses in high school because it challenges students with a new way of thinking. Hi there, I'm Ed Leon for The Great Courses. You'll find the practical tools for mastering that challenge in Algebra 1 with Professor James A. Sellers.
This clear and concise course teaches students how to solve problems and think abstractly, skills that pay off in higher math, in college, and beyond. Algebra 1 is really a transition point. Once one makes that transition, it opens lots of doors into other areas of mathematics. Professor Sellers will teach students how to represent various types of functions, linear, quadratic, rational, and radical, how to use algebraic rules, tables of data, and graphs, and in the process, learn the many types of problems that can be solved using those functions. Professor Sellers takes the fear out of learning. Even if a big problem is put in front of us, if we learn how to handle it in a step-by-step -step fashion, we can conquer it. Open up to a world of opportunity with the fundamental reasoning skills of Algebra 1.